Hello, friends. Steve Stockton here with you. Welcome to Listener Stories, a chilling series where we delve into the depths of the unknown through spine-tingling tales submitted by you, our listeners, from eerie encounters with the supernatural to inexplicable phenomena that defy all logic. Join us as we navigate the shadows of the human experience and explore the darkest corners of the imagination. Each episode promises to leave you on the edge of your seat, questioning what lurks in the darkness and what secrets lie hidden in the night. So dim the lights, settle in, and prepare yourself for a journey into the realm of the unexplained. The Walking Pole Hi Steve, here's my story about what happened to me, my brother and partner at the time. It was summer of 1981, around 5 a.m. and light outside. This happened in Port Talbot, South Wales, UK. We were in our lounge chatting, and we looked out the window where there's a mountain with a white road going around the side of it. Suddenly, we saw a 30-foot walking pole. It was walking up the side of the white road, and it had nothing holding it up. We could see the bottom of it. We watched it for about five minutes. It seemed to have a purpose sort of striding up the side of the mountain. We were gobsmacked. My brother and I still both talk about it sometimes. We called it the postman. We were 15 at the time. Thank you for inviting me to share with you. Much appreciated. Love, Lisa. Yahweh Encounters Hello, Steve and Bill. We love listening to your National Park Mysteries, so thought we would send in one of our encounters. We have attached some photos to show you the location and the vegetation in the area to give you a feel for where we were. Over the years, my wife Claire and I have watched programs and read articles on Bigfoot and other cryptids, but never thought we would one day have a close encounter of our own. Australia has its own version of Bigfoot, known as the Yowie, or Hairy Man. It's shorter and stockier than Bigfoot, and witnesses say that its head sits bang right on its shoulders, giving the impression that it doesn't have any neck at all. It also has a flattened nose and a reputation for being quite aggressive. Our first encounter was brief. In early 2010, we stayed at the Clear Mountain Lodge on Clear Mountain, about 25 miles northwest of Brisbane. The hotel is located right on top of the mountain, which is sparsely populated and covered in thick bushland. A bit further to the west is the massive Diagular State Forest, which stretches further inland and both to the north and to the south. Claire and I both loved getting out of the city together, especially away into the country, to the peace and tranquility of nature. It was not so far from the city where we lived, but far enough away to enjoy being alone for some much-needed us time. During the night, it rained heavily, and the next morning after breakfast in the restaurant, we went out for a stroll around the decking. There was no one else in sight, and we considered ourselves fortunate to be the only ones outside enjoying the morning sunshine together. We gazed in wonder at the panoramic views, bathed in the glorious, soft golden light of the fresh, clear morning. The wide brown decking was elevated high off the ground, and it wrapped around the front and side of the hotel. It was framed by a clear glass barrier, and around the side of the building, the decking ran past the kitchens and then ramped downwards to ground level. At the bottom was the car park to the right, and dense bushland to the left. When we ambled around to the side of the building, I noticed strange muddy marks along one side of the ramp that ran from the bottom right up to where the kitchens were at the top, and then they just stopped. That's odd, I thought to myself, as I dropped Claire's hand to have a closer look at them. Then I realized they looked like giant footprints. I stared in disbelief. I motioned Claire over and asked what she thought they were. She just gave me that perplexed look of, what the? We both started to shake our heads in disbelief, for each mark clearly had the shape of a huge footprint, with one large big toe next to a row of smaller toes. Someone, or something, had walked along there with bare, muddy feet early in the morning. I'm six feet tall and solidly built and I put my foot next to the one, and it was clearly double the size of my foot. Claire and I stared at each other in amazement. We were both clearly wondering who or what would walk around in bare feet in the rain and mud, and someone so big. Suddenly, it dawned on me. It must be a yaoi. We both took a sharp breath inward and uttered an expletive. 
We followed the muddy marks down to the bottom of the ramp, and every one looked the same. One giant footprint after another. It confirmed we weren't imagining the first one. Clearly, something bipedal had walked from out of the dense bushland, up the ramp, to the windows at the kitchens at the top. It looked like it had been standing outside the window and shuffling around for a while, as there were lots of footprints close together and overlapping. It was eerie to note that the footprints didn't go anywhere, though. They just seemed to stop. When we got home, we researched Yowie sightings and discovered that there had been a lot of them in and around that area, which just added to its credibility. Claire and I also loved the hinterland area of the Gold Coast and the national parks in that area. The Springbrook National Park is the first of a string of huge national parks that stretch over 100 miles inland and over 800 miles to the south. Around Springbrook and far to the west into the Lamington National Park, the terrain is often steep and rugged, with deep gorges and dense bushland, much of it more like rainforest with thick tropical undergrowth. We love to go and have overnight stays in different places, and one weekend we stayed at a place called the Lyrebird Retreat. It was set on private land with four cabins scattered amongst the thick bracken and lush ferny rainforest. The cabins were all erected along a single track that wound its way deep into the undergrowth, yet they were spaced out far enough apart that you couldn't see the next cabin along at all. It was so remote that there wasn't even a mobile phone signal there, and the only other dwelling was the owner's house, which was much back at the main entrance from the access road. The cabins were at ground level at the front, where there was also a space to park, and at the back was wooden decking with a table and chairs and a barbecue. As the land sloped, the deck at the back was about three to four feet off the ground, and the vegetation came right up to the back and sides of the buildings. We've included a few photos so you can get a feel for the location and area. Later in the year, we decided to get married, inviting just our grown-up children, their partners, and a few close friends. We thought it would be a great idea to hire all four cabins for the weekend and to actually get married right there in the rainforest. So that's what we did. Our biggest worry was the many venomous snakes the owners had warned us about, but it turned out it was the leeches which gave us the most grief. Everyone had one on them at some point, which gives you an indication of how dense the vegetation was. Everyone came and stayed a couple of nights, and we were married on the back decking. With the weekend over, everyone eventually left except for Claire's best friend Carrie and her partner Joe, who stayed on an extra night with us. After our first trip there, we discovered it was actually a hot spot for Yowie, and in fact, to our surprise, it was actually the number one hot spot in Australia. There were so many stories of Yowie encounters in the area. Many people who lived in the local town of Springbrook or had visited seemed to have Yowie stories with warnings to visitors to be wary of going into the dense undergrowth, especially at night. Builders working on houses there had heard loud, blood-curdling roars emanating from the surrounding bushland and had hurriedly finished their work so they didn't have to go back into that area again. It was just the four of us left there now, and Joe and Carrie came around to our cabin for a barbecue and drinks. Joe is Aboriginal and a very intelligent guy. He worked as a lecturer in Aboriginal studies for a university and had traveled the world extensively to places like Machu Picchu and had even been inside the Giza pyramids. He was also an elder for his tribe and deeply involved with the Aboriginal culture, so I thought he would be a great person to ask about Yowies. I tentatively asked him if he thought Yowies really existed, and he just calmly said, Yes, they do without any doubt. He told me how his granddad had seen them many times, and how when he was young he used to tell him stories about the hairy men. He told me how he had seen them himself when he was young, so he knew they really existed. He said that all Aborigines know they're real, and it's just Western culture who find it hard to believe. He explained that they live in the higher parts of the mountains, or it's inhospitable, and they're left alone. He told me it was ironic how many aboriginals were accusing the white people of stealing their lands from them, because originally it hadn't been their land at all. He said it's written in their folklore of how when the aboriginals first arrived in Australia tens of thousands of years ago, it was already occupied by the hairy men. The aborigines had fought with them, and because the aborigines were smarter, the hairy men eventually were forced to retreat to the hills 
leaving the nice coastal areas to the new arrivals. I ask how the Aborigines can claim they had their land taken from them by the white man. They themselves had originally taken it off the hairy men. He just laughed and said, they know very well, but we're just taking advantage of white people not having the courage to believe something like the Yowie could actually be real. We talked about it for a while, and he mentioned that where we were staying is just the sort of area they live in. Gary said, tell them about last night. And he told us how, late the night before, he had sensed there was something outside their cabin in the undergrowth. He had that indigenous sixth sense so many of us don't pay attention to, and was in tune with the land. He had stood in their cabin, silently in the dark for ages, watching out the window, knowing there was something out there watching back. At one point, he had actually seen something bipedal moving through the undergrowth, and also saw the silhouette of it in a small clearing. He said there was definitely a yowie around there. Joe and Carrie left the next day, and we had a couple more days there on our own. On our final night, we thought we might as well have the barbecue one last time for dinner. It was dark and lightly raining outside, so we decided to cook out there, but eat inside. I turned the lights on and went out onto the decking at the back and fired the barbecue up to cook on. I had that distinct feeling of being watched. Claire and I are very sensitive and had many unusual experiences, so we listened to those senses, and they are usually right. I have a degree in science, and so I'm also very analytical. It's my profession, and I don't easily jump to wild conclusions. The rainforest had been alive with sounds all weekend, but I noticed it was now eerily silent. When the barbecue had heated up, I went back out to put the food on it. As I was placing the sausages on the grill, I heard a big crack as a twig snapped not far away. It wasn't a lightweight twig. It was a distinct piercing snap from a reasonably thick twig. I stood there motionless and silent for a while, peering into the darkness and listening. I couldn't hear anything moving at all, as you would expect if it was an animal there. I reasoned to make a crack like that would require a reasonable amount of weight, so I was surprised I didn't hear whatever it was moving around or the rustling of leaves that, say, maybe a python might make slithering around in the scrub. A few minutes later, there was another distinct crack a few yards further over. Again, I looked and listened into the undergrowth, but it was silent. I went inside. I later came back out to check how things were cooking. The smell of meat cooking was now wafting into the surrounding undergrowth, and again, I felt like something was watching me, this time even stronger than before. Other than the lightly falling rain, it was silent. Then, crack, crack followed by maybe two or three more cracks close together, each slowly getting closer and then silence again. There was something moving around. I didn't feel good being out there anymore. I went back in and told Claire I was hearing strange noises outside and thought there was something out there, but also that it was probably just me, as I didn't want to scare, so understandably she didn't really pay much attention to it. I went back out for the final time. Straight away, I heard something moving in the bushes. This time, it was really close, not more than 20 to 25 yards away. I froze and stared intently and listened. I could actually hear it stepping through the undergrowth. I could hear each individual step, the sound of one leg slowly pushing through the undergrowth, and then the crack of a twig, followed by the same again with the other, and then a pause. I hadn't been drinking, and I know I wasn't imagining it. It was definitely bipedal. It wasn't any sort of four-legged animal or a python. It had to be either a human or a yaoi. Either way, creeping around in the dark undergrowth on private property at night in the middle of nowhere and stalking our cabin wasn't good. More twigs were cracking and I could hear the rustle of it pushing through the vegetation. I was terrified. I was ready, expecting it to appear at any second. The deck was only three or four feet off the ground, and by the time I would be able to see it, it could be stepping over the railing onto the deck. It was now taking four to five steps, then stopping completely for about a minute. Then it would start moving again. Each time, it seemed to be slowly inching its way closer. I grabbed the food from the barbecue as quickly as I could. It started moving again, and seemed to have stopped caring if it was being heard now and was taking about six to eight quick steps at a time. 
I turned around, peering into the darkness, trying to see it, but couldn't. I knew exactly where it was. I just couldn't see it because it was pitch black and the vegetation was too thick to see through. It was moving more across now rather than towards me. I could hear it moving to the right as if it was circling around our cabin and didn't want to come any closer. I turned the barbecue off and went inside and quickly locked the door, pretending it would make me feel safer. As I turned around to tell Claire what had happened, the sensor light suddenly went off out on the front of the cabin and lit up the entire front area where the car was parked. Claire jumped up and said there was someone out there and that they had set the sensor off. Remember, I hadn't told her yet what I'd just heard out the back. We couldn't see what it was, and we weren't game to go out and look. We turned the inside lights off and peered out. As I started to tell her what had happened out the back, the sensor light tripped and clicked back on a number of times. So it was still around out the front, setting off the sensor, but just keeping out of the light. Eventually, it stayed off, and we finally sat down to eat uneasily. I told Claire about what I'd heard the final time I'd gone out the back, and the earlier times, and how there was definitely something on two feet moving through the undergrowth. We spent a nervy night, wondering if whatever it was was still around or would return. Our bed was right by the main sliding door, which had floor-to-ceiling glass, and the bathroom had a floor-to-ceiling glass wall looking right into the undergrowth, with no blind or curtain to shut any stalking eyes out. Every time we looked up from the bed or went to the toilet, we half expected to see something standing outside looking in. A couple of nights earlier, Claire had said she thought she'd seen two red eyes outside the bathroom in the middle of the night, but we dismissed it at the time. The owners told us that the other three cabins were unoccupied that night, so we knew we were there on our own. It gave us both the creeps, just thinking that there was something lurking around outside, in the undergrowth, in the dark. The next morning, in the daylight, we went around to the back of the cabin and down to roughly where the noises had been coming from to see if we could see anything. One strange thing we found were branches, which had clearly been snapped off trees, laid out in uniform patterns on the ground in a way that could not happen naturally. We knew about Yowies and that Springbrook is the number one hotspot for them, but we never imagined that we might encounter one there too. Yet we both came to accept that we must have. We know that feeling now, and whenever we hear of others having strange encounters, or that feeling of being stalked, those cold, prickly goosebumps come crawling back all over our bodies again, just like an old friend telling us to trust their gut feeling, and run. Signed, Mark and Claire My Encounter with a Dark Being My encounter with what I suppose that people are referring to as a shadow man was when I was about 21 years old, although to me it just seemed like a huge dark mass without the defining features of legs or arms, although it did stand upright. Now as I think about it, it seemed almost as if it was robed with a hood on its head. At that time, I'd moved back in with my parents after a time of living out of town working with some buddies. I turned a utility building on my parents' property into my bedroom, and a friend of the family had come by for a visit while I was gone to work one day. She decided she would go out and cleanse my bedroom of any negative or evil spirits. When I got home, my mom told me what her friend had done. Well, I was grateful because back then speaking of cleansing a home was common knowledge. But up to this time, though, I had not had any negative vibes inside my bedroom. But if her friend wanted to make sure that my room was clear of evil, that was fine with me. Well, that night, after I turned in for bed, lights out, and the only light coming into my room was through the windows. I looked up to suddenly see a dark figure standing by my bed. It was standing only about six inches away from my bedside. It was about six feet tall, with a pointed-shaped head, possibly as if it were wearing a hood over its head, and it was darker than the darkness in my room. Wasting no time and drawing heavily upon my religious teachings and beliefs, I began rebuking this ghastly being in the name of Jesus, while simultaneously turning the bedside lamp on, and immediately it vanished from my room. Instead of cleansing my room of evil spirits, to my shock and surprise, undoubtedly my friend had actually dropped off an evil spirit into my room. This didn't surprise me, because it was allegedly believed by some folks that our friend practiced witchcraft from time to time, although she was a professing Christian. 
I can't say that our friend meant any wrongdoing when she decided to clean my room that day, and I'd always considered her as a person to look to for spiritual guidance. But I wonder if the line between esotericism and Christianity became a blur for her at times, or maybe she just moved from one to the other when she desired to do so. I guess a good moral of the story is, be sure and know the person who is cleansing your house of evil spirits. They have to really have power with the Most High God in order to cleanse your house. Well, I hope you enjoyed this story. Thank you for sharing. Clifton California Glimmer Man Encounter Hi, I want to share my own story and hope to bring more awareness to the topic. English is my second language, so please excuse me if my storytelling isn't good. I was an international student in 2007 when this encounter happened. At that time, I used to live alone in a small two-story townhouse in Arcadia, a small town located within Los Angeles in Southern California. College life was stressful for me. I skipped many classes and missed many class assignment deadlines, and that caused me to have depression. One evening, after watching TV all day inside my bedroom and doing nothing productive, I wanted to go to the kitchen downstairs to cook dinner. I turned off the TV, got up and walked to the door. But when I opened the bedroom door, I saw a translucent humanoid thing. It was sitting on the floor in the common area with legs crossed and its back faced my direction. I was so shocked and terrified when I saw it. I clearly saw its outlines. It was cloaked like the alien in the Predator movie. It was about five to six feet tall and a thin body. I felt a strong, malevolent energy coming from it. I closed back my bedroom door and locked it from the inside when it started to get up slowly and walk toward me. I tried to stay awake that night, with the possibility that it could go through solid doors and walls cross my mind. I turned on an audio Bible with maximum volume and prayed to God to send his divine protection. I didn't come out until the following day around noon because I thought sunlight from the windows would make that thing go away. The day after, it was gone, and I didn't ever see it again. Thank you for your time. Signed, Albert. Lake Giacomo Glimmerman Good day. My name is Christina. I have an experience with a translucent entity that I would like to share with you. My main concern is seeking answers to what exactly I have witnessed while at Lake Giacomo on two separate occasions, the second one being dark energies or black-slash-gray orbs, possibly the fae or forest spirits. The first incident was right around four years ago. I know this because the other day I found the citation I'd received on my car for being at the lake past closing time, which is sunset. Finding it brought the feelings I'd experienced that night and for several months, even years afterwards, back to me. These feelings consist of a deep need to know, almost to the point of obsession, what I saw and what other people have seen as well. I need answers. So let me explain. Myself and my boyfriend were at Lake Giacomo sometime in April 2017. I could tell you the exact date if I had the citation in front of me, but it's put away. Anyway, he and I love to be out in nature, digging up plants to plant in the yard or picking flowers or just being outdoors. We also collect things like rocks, interesting ones with crystals, also driftwood, and my favorite, arrowheads. Things like that. We also collect old bottles, and you can find most of these things there. So it was probably around 6 p.m. on that spring night when we arrive at the lake. The sun doesn't set until about 7.30 or 8. That's when they lock the gates. And it's posted. Thinking about it, it's funny because they only lock down part of the lake. The rest of the lake you can go to all night long, anytime. Anyway, so we mess around, find a snake, and video it. Then I go my own way looking for something cool to add to our collection. My boyfriend stays up on a rock cliff face, and I venture down into the area below where he is and go around the corner. We're probably 50 feet apart, but I can't see him and he can't see me. He told me that he heard a splash in the water just a good 10 minutes after I went down to where I was, which I wasn't near the water, and he thought maybe it was me messing with him, but I know it wasn't. And he thought he felt a presence of something and maybe saw movements out of a peripheral vision, which he also then again thought it was me, and he looked and didn't see anything, so then his mind started wandering. 
thinking that I was somehow doing some sort of magic or something and messing with his head, which isn't something that I would do because I'm not a practitioner of witchcraft at all. So he says he hollers for me, calls my name several times, and I didn't hear him not one time. I didn't hear anything, and so eventually he comes down and finds me. At this point, it's after dark, so we walked over toward my car to leave. Before we go, though, he decides to go down to the water to do whatever it is he wanted to do. That's when I found a citation on my car for being there after curfew, which I just found again the other day, and it reminded me of this whole thing all over again. My car was parked roughly 45 feet down off the road. The road is on a curve with a guardrail. It's also parked about 35 feet from the water where he is. I'm standing by my car when I hear what I assume is someone walking up with the road. It definitely sounded bipedal, footsteps crunching leaves. I mean, clearly, I can hear the leaves and the little twigs breaking, so it's obvious to me that somebody was up there and wanted me to know it. They weren't trying to be stealthy. But when I look up there at first, I didn't see anything. As I'm watching and listening and hearing, I begin to make out a shimmery, see-through moving thing. To me, it looked like water moving. Like on the movie The Abyss, when that water thing comes out of the water and is moving like that in a different shape, not any tubular water funnel. It was like a body or a mass of water walking. And when I say walking, I mean I could see its movements, and it was seemingly moving forward in a walking fashion, and it was crunching the leaves as it did, so telling me that it had mass and some weight behind it, even though it was practically invisible. By practically invisible, I mean I could see it, but it was definitely clear and see-through. If it wasn't moving, I might not have seen it at all. In what seemed to me to feel like almost a state of shock, like my mind was denying what I'm looking at, trying to make sense of it, there was nothing I could compare it to that I've ever witnessed before, besides in the movies. I could see through it, and I had to really focus. And I'm like, am I really seeing this? Is something walking up there? I could see it moving, like you can just tell when something's moving. And there's just enough light behind it coming from the street light that I could see it shimmer as it moved. And I'm sure no more than a minute or two goes by, and my mind still isn't sure what I'm looking at and is still in denial. It seemed to be about 10 to 12 feet tall, I swear, but I'm not the best judge of those things. So I kept looking, trying to figure out what it is I'm looking at, and I'm hearing it, and it's definitely walking. I can totally hear it and see something, and I'm about 45 to 50 feet down from where it is. It wasn't trying to be quiet, so it wanted me to know it was there. So my boyfriend comes up towards me and I say, Hey babe, I think there's somebody up there. Why don't you check it out? My boyfriend is bold and pretty much fearless, and I know he can handle himself. And at that time, I didn't feel there was any danger or I would have sent him up there. So he walks up there. I didn't tell him what I was thinking or what I saw either, because I wasn't sure at that point... And I didn't want him to think I was crazy, and I also needed some personal confirmation that I'm not crazy. So he goes up there and checks it out, comes back down, and I ask, was there somebody up there? He's like, there was something up there. And my stomach just drops, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm really not crazy, and you saw it too. And he's like, yeah, I did. I said, what was it? He said, I don't know exactly. And it just stepped over the guardrail and was gone. At that point, I'm like, okay, let's go. We get in the car and we leave. That's when I start getting really freaked out for some reason. I don't know why, but I became overwhelmingly scared right then, because I didn't know what it was, and he confirmed what I thought I saw. I really saw it, and I felt like there was no denying it. I really did see it, and it scared me. There was something invisible walking and watching us. And clearly, it wanted us to know that it was there. So we get around to the gate that they locked because it was after dark, and we're supposed to be out of there. So he walks like a football field away from me, trying to find somebody to open the gate. And I'm freaking out the whole time because he left me in the car by myself, and I'm thinking, it's going to come back and get me. He eventually comes back to the car, and we end up driving around the big stones they placed around the gate to keep people in or out so people can't drive around it. We found a way, and I was terrified the whole time, mainly because I didn't know what it was, and I never saw anything like that before or heard of anything like that. But we got out of there, and I was obsessed for the longest time with figuring out what it was. 
I Googled it, everything I could think of, and I came across the Reddit story and your other stories about some witness encounters with invisible beings in the woods, but no definitive answers. These were just stories people told, just like me, but nobody seems to know what it is. And I'm sure people thought I was nuts for a while because I was talking about it because I wanted to know what it was. I wanted to know what it was, why it was there, where it came from, and why it chose us. Lee's Summit is not a small town. A lot of people bike and hike out there along with fishing and camping. So I was hoping that somebody else had seen it as well. How am I going to find out unless I talk about it, share my story, and ask questions? But as you would expect, everybody just kind of looked at me like I was crazy. My boyfriend wouldn't talk about it with anyone, barely would even talk about it with me. And there I was obsessed over it. Eventually, you know, I just got tired of looking without finding any answer. So I kind of put it out of my mind after I spent hours researching, telling people my story, asking people with no real progress being made, and no real answers in solving my riddle. I even went back and visited the lake by myself, trying to see if I could see it again. I went in the daytime, though. I'm not that brave. I mean, I really wanted an answer. My desire to find answers was stronger than my fear of this entity. Who knows? If I'd ran into it again by myself, I might change my mind about which one was stronger. When I found my citation the other day, it came back into my mind and has become a strong guiding focal point again in my life. Seems like it's not quite as taboo to talk about such things as it was even four years ago, and I want to find answers still. I'm hoping that you or somebody will talk about it on the show or other shows and amongst the people that you communicate with or just anyone in general you come across and get the ball rolling on finding more evidence on what it is, who else has had sightings, so on. I know more and more sightings of these invisible creatures have happened, and I believe we need to know and should be making it a priority to find out what they are exactly. I feel something that can cloak itself with invisibility is a big deal, and we should educate ourselves on what we're dealing with, and you would think the government would be all over that. I won't settle for assumptions. We need to know what they are, no guessing. I've heard Bigfoot and aliens, but I want to know for sure. I want to know 100%, no question. Okay, so that was the first experience at Lake Giacomo. The other one was just a couple months ago when I went to the lake all by myself, because I'm a big girl. But kidding, making jokes. But I was alone. And on this day, there was nobody out there. I could have screamed and there would have been nobody near enough to hear me. The overall energy was a little unnerving. I typically always walk down a certain trail, and I go down by the water and I look for driftwood, and then I go back to the trail and keep walking around, checking on my little spots for gorgeous driftwood I can't live without. That day, it just felt different. I felt uneasy, and I thought I heard somebody holler something while I was down by the water, but I didn't see anybody. And I know for a fact there were no cars parked at the trailhead when I came down just moments before. I can remember feeling like I needed to constantly be aware of my surroundings, and generally I'm stuck in the dirt looking for arrowheads or looking for driftwood, and I'm not paying attention to my surroundings. But that day, something told me that I needed to. Of course, there was also the fact that I kept seeing what I thought was a bird flying from one tree to another out of my peripheral vision when I looked up there. But there would be nothing there, and it happened several times. Once again, I told myself, you're leaving. But I didn't leave. Instead, I got my phone out, and I started recording. And I went on for about, I don't know, 20 minutes. Turned around and went back, ignoring my gut feelings. But I made it out of there, and when I got home, I went over my video footage. And lo and behold, I caught a black orb. But I know I saw it following me around. I caught it no less than 14 times on three different videos. This, plus a couple other different anomalies, and I would like to know what they are and what it meant. I did look up orbs and their colors and meanings. Black orbs usually get a bad reputation because they usually accompany something bad happening to somebody. But the role of these entities, as far as I understood it to be, is to make you uncomfortable so you leave a certain situation because there's something in the area or in front of you that's going to harm you. So, really, in my eyes, they're a blessing. It's like they're watching out for you, even if they make you feel uncomfortable. It's for a good reason. So the same token, I didn't leave when I felt like I should have that day. Instead, I kept going and recording, and nothing bad happened to me. So maybe they weren't even black orbs after all. Maybe they were some other type entity. 
I don't know, but I sure would like some answers. Thanks. Signed, Christina. My Strange Encounters My story is similar to some I've heard on your channel. However, it happened to me before I ever knew there were other stories out there. It started as I began studying ancient folk religions for a class in university. At least, I believe this type of thinking is what conditioned my mind to be sensitive and perceptive to the experience. Come near the end of the semester, I was tripping acid before final exams. The trip I had was beyond belief. I was sitting on the couch when all of a sudden, or slowly, I could not tell the time, there was a haunting gale that became audible, like a tornado had surrounded my apartment. Then, from out of an electrical socket, came multiple, around ten, small creatures that I at the time called electric elves. They were several inches tall and a dark color. They were laughing and giggling as they crawled all over my body. However, I felt no sensation, only visual and audible registers of the phenomenon. Now, I have tripped many times before, and this encounter was completely unlike anything I'd ever experienced because of how tangible and real it was. My girlfriend was with me and her usually timid dog. The dog was laying under the bed for most of the day, but as soon as this experience came on, the dog came right out from the bedroom and crawled onto my lap. The dog was completely relaxed, so I was too. I eventually got up and moved from the couch after my girlfriend began a conversation, thus ending the experience. But this was only the beginning. The days to come would yield much more vivid sensations of the otherworldly, and I was much more sober too, debunking the idea that it was purely an induced hallucination due to the drug. I could not stay at my normal place because of vivid apparitions that would come to me after a long study session even weeks before my intake of any hallucinogen. I saw many things manifest in the dark void of my closet late at night, some that could only be explained as religious. I saw a four-winged owl and what appeared to be three shadow figures and a much smaller hooded figure beside them. Even when I closed my eyes, I could not stop seeing these things. I noticed that my ability to understand my studies had greatly increased and I was designing complete chemical processes out of my head and making inferences to the most complex quantum mechanical principles and atomic properties that were not taught to me at the level of school I was at. This is something even professional chemists have trouble doing. I feel like this increased level of insight was due to the thinning of the veil that was already occurring around me, like accessing another dimensional fount of knowledge and power. I had to get out of this house. But the end of the semester was here, so to take my final exams, I rented a hotel room for a week and went to work. During and after my last test, I kept feeling the uncontrollable urge to get on a plane, without a set destination. But I eventually settled on Phoenix, Arizona, due to my girlfriend having family in the area. I would make it to the city, but the first night proved to be too much for me. I resisted several uncontrollable urges to get on the plane, but eventually succumbed to the external pressure beckoning me onward and dropped everything and took the flight. Even on the plane, I felt the sensation that I was leaving this world in one way or another. I did not arrange for a hotel, choosing instead to spend the first night under the stars. To get a better look at them, I climbed atop a two-story building and laid out on the roof. From this roof, I saw an extremely large triangular craft with lights running evenly spaced along its trim in the air. I stayed here for some time and was then shown two balls of light far in the distance of the night sky. They were plummeting directly into the earth, one after the other. However, there were no tails like shooting stars, though they did give off a reddish light. Their trajectory did not match any meteor as they moved at a 90 degree angle with the ground, meeting it at a point in the distance. There was no sound of impact or flash of light. I knew immediately this was it what I'd been brought out here to see. In order to get a better look at both phenomenons, I tried to climb down to the ground. It seemed to be as easy as when I climbed up, but when I committed to the climb, I felt a shift of gravity and was pulled backwards off the ledge by some external force. I hit the ground, breaking my wrist and elbow, as well as shattering a vertebrae in my back. In the hospital, I saw a reflection in the metal light above my hospital bed of my own funeral with all my family. 
However, my casket was open and the service was being held in the house where I'd initially started having the visuals in the closet instead of a church. I looked away several times for long periods, hoping it would go away, but every time I looked up at the light, it was still there. Also, one of my nurses seemed to know what was happening to me and wrote a strange rune on the glass window to the bathroom of the hospital room. It looked like something occult and was no way a medical or scientific symbol. As I'm a trained chemist and electrician, a man of science. The following day, I was moved out of this room that was in a tower into a separate tower. After my transfer, I attempted to locate the first tower I was in, but it seemed to not exist as there were no signs in the hospital for it. I was crippled for a long time, but after my surgery, I had rods inserted into my back that completely returned my mobility with basically no pain. It was a literal miracle that I had bone fragments lodged in my spinal cord that should have at least partially paralyzed me. The weirdness of visions did not stop there. I returned to my hometown after being released from the hospital in Phoenix and immediately moved out of the old haunted house I was staying in before. My parents were skeptical, but helped me as they could tell I was experiencing something strange, having told them of the off feelings I was having even before my trip to Arizona. I moved into a hotel while I was waiting for the paperwork to process for a new lease. At this hotel, I had several visions, mainly of a floating head of an old man telling me something I couldn't make out, possibly insulting me. I was awake for this, not dreaming, as I got up from the bed after the vision disappeared to make sure. Then, after moving into my new apartment, it seems that not only did whatever was at the first house follow me, but it had been amplified by my experience in Phoenix. The first strange thing happened about a week into my new lease. I was in bed and fell asleep like usual. It is where I woke up that truly startled me. I came to on my balcony of the third floor and was thrust into a literal fight for my life with a force I could not see, but it was very strong and was trying to force me over the railing to fall to the ground below, probably trying to finish the job from earlier when I'd survived. I was screaming and panting in a cold sweat but managed to wrestle myself back inside and close the door, bolting it shut. I immediately broke down at the sheer gravity of the situation and had to call my girlfriend to let her know. She knew weird things were happening and did not know what to make of it, but she was worried and was inclined to agree with me. I had been completely normal before these things started happening. The next phenomenon that happened to me occurred late at night again, as they did at the first residence, though there were many, many figures that looked like alien or extra-dimensional. They were phantasmal, as if made of energy or matters that we are not. One of them appeared to be in charge, and he would look directly at me while standing over my bed. I never felt fear and actually smiled at them because I could tell they were harmless, or if they did want to hurt me, they would just do it. They were trying to show me something, whatever that was. My room would be full of several of these creatures, all of different appearances, all metaphysical in nature. It seems they came through my window like the moonlight itself. Eventually the visions lessened, and as I healed, perhaps they were involved in my injury and recovery, perhaps as a study of our medical capabilities, or just because, in their infinite transcendental existence, they are bored and see us as playthings. Whatever happened to me cannot be written off as a mere psychedelic experience, as I was not under the influence of hallucinogens for 90% of the encounters. I feel that whatever it is can completely control and manipulate our brain waves and possibly enter our bodies as a possession. May it be demons, aliens, ghosts, spirits of nature, I do not know, nor am I going to stress the specifics. I just know what I saw and felt, and it was too real. I felt a new sense of agency after this experience, like I had been chosen to bear some higher knowledge than most of my fellow men and had to pay a flesh price for it with my vertebra bone that was extracted from my body. I do not want this power to connect with the other side, nor do I want it. I simply am it. Signed, Gray. Blessed and Cursed From birth, I guess the Lord had a plan that was going to be very unique for me. I was born an identical twin. I came second, my brother coming first. He was deceased at birth. My mom told me it changed my dad forever that day. He was in the hallway of the hospital crying like a baby when the doctor came out and said, Come back in. She's having another baby. There's another one in the womb. It gave my dad new hope, I guess, but he was never the same again. 
What was to come from my birth and my brother's passing was going to be unique for me growing up and in manhood as well. We grew up in a city in Ohio called Norwood. At the top was a sacred mound called Indian Mound, an old Indian burial ground. Growing up, I would hear a lot of stories. It was cursed. All those buildings, a city right next to and on top of an Indian burial ground, the Indian souls had been disturbed clearly. And throughout life, it seems like the whole town was cursed. My first incident happened when I was about eight. We lived rough growing up. My dad was a bad alcoholic. He would come in every night and beat on my mom and throw plates of food against the wall. I was forced to become a young man quicker than most. I walked my sister to school every day. It was my duty, so I took it seriously. We lived on Linden Avenue, the end of Linden Avenue. That sat on a hill, and at the top you could see a crossover into the woods right there, and you were at Indian Mound. Decent amount of forest that ran all the way up to Linder Park and Paradise Pond as well. One warm day, walking home from school, the woods to the left of us and the houses are on the right. I'd always kept my little sister to the inside, the safest point from any danger. We were half a block away from home, when out of nowhere I heard what sounded like a whoop and a snort as a rock crashes into the street right beside us. Startled by the sound, we both jumped a bit, off to the side, just out of instinct, to evade what had come our way. I turned around and gave a look behind us, didn't see anything out of the way. No kids playing tricks, no cars either. So I turned around and we continued walking. Not even ten minutes later, a bigger rock comes crashing down the street, as well as another whoop, causing us to jump in the air as it hit the street. My sister was really afraid at this point. I look over toward the woods this time, and what I envisioned next was frightening. Standing in between the cut of the woods was a creature, black and light gray hair coming off its arms and two legs, a dark, tan, leathery face, but mostly hair on its face, though not much skin showing. Like I said, it moved so defensive to not be spotted as it had a huge muscular build as well, about seven to eight feet tall and pushing 600 pounds. It was moving left to right its arms shaking two small trees that were a bit taller as it moved back and forth evasively and methodically. This thing was quite scary, the build of this thing. Just even seeing it vaguely was frightening for kids our age. I turned to my sister and say, run now, don't look back. I grabbed her hand and we bowled off around the corner and down the hill to our house. Burst through the front door and I run into the kitchen and tell my mom, call the police now. There's a monster up on Indian Mound, mom growling and whooping and throwing rocks at us. It was trying to hit us. As my mother turns, she gives me a look as she says, Kids these days, you're all crazy. She paid it no attention and told us to go to our rooms and do our homework. I remember being so damn mad that she wouldn't believe us, and now because of that we may be taken during this night from our beds by this thing, that it would surely track us down and come through our window and take us, or we'd come out of the woods and grab us the next day on our way to school or on the way home. We were so traumatized by what had happened, we never went that route ever again. I'd heard the stories, but these creatures were supposed to be deep in the woods. Not woods like ours. I mean, there were a lot of woods in Norwood, but there was a lot of city as well. All the woods ran along the outer edge of the city and formed in a full circle, and the railroad tracks ran right smack through the middle of town, from the north side through to the south. So, I figured this creature had to have traveled here and just didn't want to be seen that day. This was my first encounter. I'd have two more encounters of the creatures in my life, and the next one would come later as a young man while fishing with my best friend up by Lake Cowan in northeastern Ohio. The stars must have aligned that night because this fishing trip was going to be life-changing. We just didn't know it yet. My dad and my two uncles, Rocky and Mike, a former Army Ranger, were heading to Tom's Mountain. An old buddy of my Uncle Mike's had a big piece of land out by the Miami Whitewater Forest sat right beside it. Now that setup of having that park and all that forest was key, I believe, in what happened later that night. We got to Tom's Mountain and made the climb, and it was a hell of a climb, just to get up there, just to fish. It was damn well near a 90-degree climb up, and it was a warm September day. We got to the top and were nearly worn out. You always threw your gear down and bent over to suck air after that climb, hands on knees, but it was always worth it. The fishing was killer, always. Now, it started as a 90-degree climb, but 
then flattened out a half mile up, and Lake 1 was perfectly flat. But on the north side was another climb up a 60-degree angle up to Lake 2, another 100, 150 yards up, but no one ever had the energy to go any further. Why? The fishing was killer, as I said. There was a ridge that started from the climb up to Lake 2 that ran all the way back towards Tom's but wrapped back around towards Lake 2. We're talking about 6,000 acres of Miami Whitewater Forest sat right next to it. So we're talking massive forest, mass waterways, lakes, pond, and plenty of game, deer, rabbits, squirrels, etc. We started fishing. The cows were over on the left side of the lake. The forest sat three feet from Lake 1. Hard to fish the left side. We'd always get our lines hung up in the trees, so no one ever hardly fished that side unless using artificial bait and casting sideways. The fish were biting like crazy that day. Everyone catching. The day went fast as always. There was a beautiful place. And the fishing slowed down out of nowhere. So we all set up for the night fishing part we'd never done before. Not there, anyway. Slip bobbers on, the minnow buckets full of bait. We switched over for crappie fishing. Well, we were catching one here and there, and about 12 midnight, the cows got up and left out of nowhere to Lake 2. We thought nothing of it and kept fishing about an hour later up on up the ridge. And we heard something coming our way, moving slow, snapping, cracking, moving evasively, almost methodical. We thought, eh, dear, kept on fishing, even though I had a weird feeling come over me, like, what if it's something else? I quickly shrugged that off and fished on. Well, everything shut down about 45 minutes later to a halt. And I hated when that happened, so I thought, well, I'll go over and fish the left side. I knew where a five-foot hole was, where I'd catch a couple more if all else failed. Always did. So I decided to make my move over, grab my pole, the middle bucket, and the lantern. That way we'd have all the light to see what we were doing. We had nightsticks on our bobbers anyway, so... Well, as I got to the turn to hit the left side, I put the lantern on where I'd be fishing. But out of nowhere, light hit on a creature that was crouched down on two legs. Not four or three, but two. It had an arm in the water and was scooping water. When it realized it had a light on it, it slowly pulled its hand up out of the water, and I saw the water dripping slowly from its hand. It slowly turned its head over its left shoulder to glance at me, started growling, let out a low, curdling, mouth-opening growl. Slowly it opened its eyes. They were a wicked yellow color. Its fur was layered, maybe three-quarter of an inches and kind of thick, and a beautiful cinnamon color. It had four canine teeth I'd seen as well, and a mouthful of other teeth. All muscle. This thing was crouched four feet or so. So I figured later, probably if it stood up, it'd be seven to seven and a half feet tall and maybe 400 or more pounds. It was broad-shouldered, but not huge. Huge like others I'd described, but still very impressive to say the least. I was frozen stiff with fear. Slowly it turned to its right, gave a look out of the woods, and then let out a breath of air at the end of its growl. As if it were disgusted, it had been seen. It had come down off that ridge and didn't have a clue we were there. We were always quiet up there, hardly talked while fishing, so this creature had no clue. So we must have disrupted its schedule by being there clearly at this time of night. I slowly came to my senses after clearing my mind of what I'd just seen. Fear was present now for all of us involved. This creature was still kind of giving me a half look as it was also looking toward the woods in front of it. It was only about three feet away. That's how it came down. I knew at this moment it couldn't smell us. We were downwind, and the whole time, as it was creeping down, I heard my dad say, Junior, what is that? You see that? My uncle said the same thing as well. I finally broke free from the fear, and I yelled down the mountain, Now! And I bolted toward the edge. I look over the creature, still staring half at us, half toward the woods. I look to the edge. I see my family jump over. I was right behind them as they hit the ground at that downslope running. I hit shortly after running past them. I lifted the light only to slow me down a little bit, and they all crashed into the back of me and all fell over down the hill, the lantern still in my hand. I was already tired and drained, feeling hopeless, yet pumped from what I'd just seen. I look back, nothing behind us. I'm still thinking any second now it's going to grab one of us. I was remembering stories from my youth and my earlier encounters as a kid coming home from school. We struggled to get to our feet. It seemed like hours getting to the bottom of the hill. Finally, we did make it to the car, everyone on hands and knees, sucking wind to breath, asking each other what the hell that was we just saw. Others saying, you know damn well what we just saw. When you put the light on that thing, we all knew what it was. 
But we agreed not to say a word. We didn't want people to come out here stalking this thing on Tom's land, as it was his land, not ours, needless to say. All the gear was left behind except the lantern. My Uncle Mike went back later and got it, armed, of course. After that incident, it was all confirmed for me after that night about my earlier incidents in life, like the one walking home from school along Indian Mound. I now knew what that was, again, that I'd seen that day on the way home from school. I guess you could say I've been blessed or cursed in life, but either way, it's all worth it, and I wouldn't take any of it back. Every bit of this story is true. Signed, J.D.L. UFO Sightings in the Swamp Good afternoon. My husband and I are over-the-road truck drivers and listen to videos on your channel on our deliveries. We're from Waycross, Ware County, Georgia, and we have both had UFO sightings. He's actually had what I would call more than a sighting, a possible encounter. We wanted to write in to tell you his story. Feel free to share this with your listeners on the channel as well. No names were mentioned in this story, so you do not have to worry about anonymity. I wanted to write in for a while now and tell you these stories, especially his, as so many details in his encounter align with those of the missing 411 cases. But while watching your videos today, we heard you say that a lot of these cases involve are in close proximity to water. Well, when I heard that, I decided I wanted to go ahead and send our stories in to you as soon as possible, because I'm not sure if you know where, where County, Georgia is located or anything about it. We are near the Georgia-Florida line, and in our county, stretching into Florida, is a large swamp, 648 square miles, called the Okefenokee. That's not all. Not only do we have the Okefenokee, we live in close proximity to the Atlantic Ocean and have the Satilla River that zigzags through the northern part of the county. I've seen something, and my husband's cousin has also seen something in the same exact area, on what we believe is the same exact night before we ever even met each other. But none of our stories compare to my husband's. Let me say, my husband is not the type to make things up for attention, not at all. We are both no-nonsense type of people. What follows is his story in his words. Back in the summer of 1994, around 7.30 p.m., right across the road from my mother's house, myself and five other guys around 14 years old, and my cousin and five more guys around 18 years old, were playing basketball in an open field right across the road from my mother's house. The field we were in is not in a secluded area. People are often seen walking around at any given time. It is very well populated inside the city limits and can be seen from almost all the guys' homes out there with us on this night. The sun had just went down when I noticed a light maybe 125 feet in the air. I look up and put my head back down in disbelief, trying to convince myself that it was nothing. That's when I hear another guy yell, Y'all look at that! I shout, I knew I saw something. This causes everyone to look up. Now that I'm looking back up, I notice that it isn't just a light. What I'm now looking at is a black, triangular-shaped object, about the width of five mobile homes. It was floating over mobile homes and pine trees, a length of about 80 feet long and a height of about 20 feet, with four square, light orange-colored lights, one in each corner of the triangle and one in the middle, seemingly floating just over the pine trees. I notice that there isn't a sound. Everything is completely silent around us, including this massive UFO flying overhead. None of the guys are making a sound. We're all looking up at this huge object floating overhead. At this time, I'm thinking, how could something so big, floating in the air, make no sound whatsoever? After what felt like no longer than 30 seconds, trying to figure out exactly what we're looking at, I hear one of the guy's uncles who was walking toward us from down the road yell to us, Y'all see that? Y'all get in the house. After I see him, I take one look back, and I'm now looking at the back of the triangular-shaped object, and then we all take off running to our homes around the neighborhood. As we're running towards our house, my cousin and I notice all the lights in the house are on. We run in the house in a panic, tell my mom and his mom what we saw. They angrily interrupt us, asking us where we'd been, yelling at us that we had not been in the field and they had been looking for us. Mind you, the field we were in is literally across the road from our house. They could walk out onto the porch and see the wide open field from there, where we were standing while looking at the UFO 
where they should have been able to see us without even stepping off the porch. Now, we had a rule in our house, and the same rule applied to most of the guys who were playing basketball with us that night. And that rule is, we must be in the house before the streetlights come on. The streetlights come on about the time we saw the UFO floating overhead. Remember, I said that we noticed the UFO at around 7.30 p.m. and had only been standing there staring at it for around 30 seconds? Well, imagine our surprise when we hear our mothers tell us that it's close to 12 a.m. The following morning, all the guys who saw the UFO and their parents met outside of my and my cousin's house and basically had a neighborhood meeting about everything that happened the night before. Turns out, none of the parents that looked for us that night saw us in the field. Most of the parents could look out their windows and see the field from their homes. And all the guys out there came in the house that night around four to four and a half hours later than they thought it was. I'm not sure why none of our parents could see us that night in the field. All ten to twelve of us were in a very open field playing basketball when we saw the UFO floating overhead. As I said, many of the parents could simply look out of their windows that night and see us in that field. When the guy's uncle who came up the road who yelled at us to get inside and out from under the UFO, he came from the opposite side of the field from where my mom lived. I'm not sure if we were cloaked in some way from one side of the field, and that's how the uncle who came from the other side could see us, and my mom and aunt couldn't from our house, or if when he yelled at us to get inside, he created some type of distraction for whoever or whatever was cloaking us and broke the spell, for lack of better terms, that hid us from our parents' view, or if we just simply weren't there at all, like we thought we were, as if we were transported somewhere else without our knowledge. All I do know is, none of the parents could see us in that field until we were yelled at to get inside by one of the guy's uncles, and that we all lost about four hours of time that night. As the years went on, all the guys would talk about what we saw that night when we ran into each other. I never really spoke to my cousin about it, though, but as adults, I asked him one day did he remember it. He told me he did, and that he and the older guys saw something that neither I nor any of the younger guys had seen. In the back of the field, there's a huge oak tree. It grows different than the other trees in that area. The trunk of this tree appears to be twisted, as if someone grabbed it from the branches and twisted the entire tree until the whole trunk looked like when you twist a washcloth to wring water out of it. Also, nothing grows around this specific tree. An entire circle about ten feet out from the tree, no other plants grew, no grass, weeds, or anything else, only sand. That night, in front of this tree, my cousin said they saw a ball of light getting bigger and bigger. What he said, to him, appeared to be a portal, with what he called a Bigfoot slowly appearing as the circle of light grew larger. And that's when he heard someone yell to us to get inside our houses, and the portal and the Bigfoot disappeared. None of the younger guys saw this, but all of the older guys had. Until then, I had never heard of Bigfoot. Nothing like that was on television yet, and I'd heard of UFOs before, but had never seen anything like that, and hadn't looked into it much at all. There's nothing that I had heard or seen prior to this encounter that would have influenced what we had all seen that night, or our story in any way, from the way the UFO looked, the silence, the portal, the Bigfoot, our disappearance or loss of time. Thank you for listening to this story and for all that you do. As I said, you seem to be one of the few people taking this seriously and handling these cases with the victims in mind, not sensationalizing the cases or adding things to them for entertainment. And that's so very important. Sincerely, M&T. Three Experiences from Eve Hi, Eve here. This experience happened to me when I was in my early 20s. I used to live in a small town in Puerto Rico called Comarillo. I had a house on top of my parents' house, which in Puerto Rico is considered a separate house, but in the United States it would be considered a duplex, I guess. My house had a separate staircase that led to the outside. To go to those stairs, you would have to open the front door of my house, walk out onto the balcony, which was very long, and then go downstairs. Now you're outside in the front yard. If you turned left, then made another left, you would go to a balcony in my parents' house, and there was the entrance to their home. Every evening before going to bed, I would visit my parents to check on them and to say goodnight. This was something I did every night. 
One night, after watching TV in the living room with my husband, I decided to go to bed. I wanted to read a book and then go to sleep. My husband asked me if I was going to say goodnight to my parents. I told him that I really felt I wanted to lay down at that moment, and besides, I'd seen them at about 4.30 that afternoon, and they seemed fine. So, I headed to the bedroom. I started fixing the pillows and the blankets. I closed the windows in my bedroom, turned the lights off, turned on the lamp that was by my side of the bed, looked at the clock, and noticed it was 9.11 p.m. Sat in bed and slowly laid down. As soon as my head touched the pillow, I felt I was pulled out upward from the bed and found myself standing in front of the bed. Everything looked smoky, like when there's a mist outside during a humid fall morning. I felt confused. Didn't I just lay down? What happened? All these questions traveled through my head in less than a second, and when I looked down, I was laying in bed. Well, my body was laying in bed. I panicked. Did I die? I was so confused. I can't even explain the level of confusion I was feeling at this time. I felt somebody or something was standing next to me, and somehow, whatever this being was, it talked to me. I heard its voice, but it was inside my head. I don't know if this makes sense, but it was like communication through thoughts. I tried to look to my left where I felt this being was standing, but I couldn't really see what it was. I know it did not scare me. I asked what happened, and the being told me to follow him. So I did. We go out of the bedroom, walk through the hallway. We pass the living room where my husband was still sitting watching TV. I looked at him and lifted up my hand as a wave at him, but he didn't see me. We kept walking. We walked through the balcony and then went down the stairs into the front yard. We went inside my parents' balcony, and we went through the door, and I looked on my mom and dad seated on the couches watching the TV. I looked at the TV and noticed they were watching a boxing match. I stared at my parents for a few seconds, but they did not notice I was there. The being asked me to come and look through the window. When you looked through the window, you could see the river and a mountain that was across the river. That night, it was dark. I looked up into the sky, and there were twelve moons forming a circle. All of them started moving, and they made triangle shapes. So there was a group of three moons that made a triangle shape, another group of three moons that made a triangle shape, and so on. When I saw these, I felt scared, but I couldn't understand what it meant and what was happening. Then I heard screaming and crying to my left, and I looked, and there was another mountain to the left, and it looked like behind it was fire and a war. I heard women and children crying and screaming. I heard gunshots and explosions. Behind the mountain, everything looked orange. I felt like crying. I was really scared. I looked to my right to see the being next to me, but I couldn't see him. I asked him, what is this? Why am I looking at this? What does this mean? He replied, figure it out. And at that very moment, I felt like I fell abruptly into my bed. I sat down in bed and I looked to my left. The light on the lamp was still on. I looked at the clock. It was 9.13 p.m. I immediately stood up and went running to the living room where my husband was still watching TV. He looked at me and smiled, and I was looking at him with a face that read, I just saw a ghost. He asked if everything was okay. I said, did you just see me walk past you? He said, didn't you just say you were going to bed because you wanted to read a book? I replied, yes, but did you just see me go outside or something? He said that he couldn't understand what I was trying to say, so I told him, never mind. I opened the door and I went downstairs quickly. I opened my parents' front door, and there were my parents sitting in the living room watching a boxing match. I couldn't believe it. They were exactly in the same position I'd seen them in a few minutes ago during that bizarre experience. My mom and dad looked at me and smiled. My mom said, we thought you were not coming to say goodnight. I said, did you guys just see me like a few minutes ago? They shook their head no, and my mom said that the last time they saw me was about 4.30 that afternoon, and she thought that was because it was late and I was not coming to say goodnight. I was so, so, so confused. I headed to the window and I looked into the sky, 
but there wasn't anything strange in the sky, obviously. It was just a regular sky with one moon, like it's supposed to be. I looked to my left toward the mountain that was on fire, but everything was fine, dark as it should have been, quiet as it should have been. I put my hands on my head, and I looked at my parents again. They were looking at me like I was losing my mind. I felt like I was. I told them to forget it, that I must have had a dream or something. I hugged and kissed them goodnight and went back to my house to explain to my husband what had just happened to me. He told me that I must have been dreaming. I do not believe at all that I was dreaming. I know this sounds very weird and bizarre, but this truly happened to me, and I know it was not a dream. As of today, I have absolutely no idea what the moons and everything that was happening during that experience mean. If anyone has any idea what this could mean, please let me know. It's been about 20 years since this happened to me. Hi, Eve here again. This is my second story. I usually don't share these because I'm afraid of being laughed at. Unfortunately, people immediately think you're crazy, but here I go. Whether people think these are true or not, it makes no difference to me because I know what I've lived. As I said before, I used to live in a small town in Puerto Rico called Camarillo. At the time, I was married and my husband was working a night shift. Every night, I would accompany him to his car to say goodbye to him before leaving to go work. Because there were a lot of UFO sightings in Puerto Rico, we would always look up into the sky, looking for lights or things moving, etc. We would often laugh, like of mocking the UFO phenomenon. However, one of these nights, when he was already in the car ready to leave, I was giving him a kiss goodbye. I looked up into the sky, looking for strange things, but like always, there wasn't anything out there. I looked up, left, right, everywhere, but there wasn't anything strange. Surprisingly, when I was lowering my head back down to say goodbye to my husband one more time, I noticed a beam of light, really bright, kind of light blue color, coming from the sky, and I immediately looked up again, but there wasn't anything anymore. So, I chuckled and said, Ha! Because I'm looking for a UFO, I thought I saw something. Silly me. I waved goodbye to my husband and headed to the backyard where my mom was hanging clothes. Now, let me explain a little bit about this scenario here. I come from a poor family, and we did not have a lot, especially not a dryer. There were no laundromats in town either, so we had to hang our clothes outside to dry. My mom worked during the day, and at night she would do her laundry and hang it in the backyard, which was out in an open field. So that night, before I'd gone to say goodbye to my husband, she had told me that she was going to hang clothes in the backyard. I told her that as soon as he was gone, I'll go back there and help. Well, as soon as he left, I headed back there, and as when I reached a point where I knew she could hear me, I started talking. I said, Mom, I was saying goodbye to Joe, not his real name, and I was looking. I couldn't finish my sentence because when I looked at my mom, she was looking up into the sky in a frozen state. I just could not believe it. She had seen something, and I had just missed it. That's my luck. At least, that's what I thought at the moment. I started talking to her hysterically. Oh my God, Mom, don't tell me you saw it. I thought I saw something, but when I looked, it was too late. What did you see? This was followed by complete silence. My mom was still frozen in the same position. I was confused. Was my mom ignoring me? My mom is not that type of person. She's also not dramatic or an attention seeker, so her behavior at the moment was really bizarre to me. I called to her. Mom? Mom? I finally raised my voice. Mom, what's going on? At that moment, she snapped out of her frozen state and said, Did you see that? I looked at her, confused. What do you mean, did I see that? I asked. She said, Well... I was hanging close when I saw this light blue light coming quickly down towards me. As it came closer, I noticed there were other lights too. These lights made a shape. It was like a plate, like a disc. Then the lights came down so fast and, she paused, they almost shot inside me. I felt like I couldn't move nor react. Now you're here. 
Like I mentioned before, my mom is not one to like getting attention or making up stories. As a matter of fact, my mother is a very respected person in my town, and everybody knows her as a serious, respectable, and professional woman. This experience has followed me all my life because I saw a flash of light that night, and the color was what my mother had described. To have found her like this, and for her to have told me what she said she saw and experienced, has been shocking to me till this day. Hi, Eve again. This is a story of my youngest memory. My life began, as I mentioned before, in a small town in Puerto Rico called Camarillo. When I was four years old, I was still sleeping in a crib. And I remember that as soon as my mom would turn off the lights at night and leave the room, three demons would appear hovering on top of my crib. As soon as these demons would appear, a noise would start coming from the kitchen towards my bedroom. The noise sounded like a person had a wooden leg, and this person was slowly approaching my room. This noise would terrify me to the core, and I'd be looking at the door, which my mother would always leave a little bit open, waiting for whatever this was to make its appearance through that door. The kitchen was only about 20 feet from my room. However, the thing coming from the kitchen, which I always thought to be a man with a wooden leg, would never make it to my room. I would start crying and screaming for my parents to come to my room because the noise was terrifying and those demons were tormenting with their evil laughs and dances. As soon as my mom would push open the door, the demons would vanish and the sound coming from the kitchen would stop right away. I would tell my mom what I was seeing and hearing, but she never believed me. She would leave the room and it would start all over again. I remember hearing a voice behind me telling me in Spanish, they will never believe you. This happened to me for many years, but I don't remember when it stopped. Thank God it doesn't happen anymore. I'm 40 years old now, and many strange things have happened in my life that, as of today, I have no explanation for. Thank you for listening. Eve. Funeral for a friend. Hello. A while back, I discovered your channel, specifically your video about Trini Gibson, and I've been hooked ever since. It's been a great way of making the day go by. I hear these stories on the compilation, and it's changed my perspective on my encounter, because I've been embarrassed about it. But now, I feel confident to get this off my chest. This happened just a few years back, not long after my phone blew up with messages telling me that an old friend of mine, Cleo, had died in a car accident. I'll be honest about it. I hadn't hung with Cleo since right after high school, and thinking about it, I wondered if he was ever a friend. I didn't know what to feel, and it put me in a bad place for a couple of days. Sitting around my apartment with this metallic taste lingering in my mouth, like when you're a kid and lose a tooth, and you can't do anything except taste blood until it heals. That kind of mindset isn't healthy. I pushed it aside and got back to my friend Chris, who was putting together a little memorial for Cleo on the following Saturday. Just the old gang, he said. Sure, I replied. It would be great to see them again. It's funny. You can say something on Facebook and feel completely different in real life. I guess it doesn't take a genius to notice that, but it was how I was feeling. I spent the whole six-hour drive going over my life in that town, or what had been. I'd left so fast, the memories felt like gray mush in my skull, and the only thing left was this itchy feeling that I was right to do so. I kept wondering what they would think of me. We weren't old, just approaching our thirties, but from the little I paid attention to on Facebook, they seemed to be on their way to better and brighter things. Chris, for example, was already running the old slaughterhouse on the edge of town and already had a wife and daughter and a house, too, all by twenty-four. Passing the city limits, sunset and tired, made things worse. A ton of bricks weighed down on my shoulders and neck, tightening my head and making me sweat hard, even though it was early December and I was driving with the windows down. I felt like a candle that someone had thrown water on. Old times flooding back, I guess. I didn't want to meet up with them right away. I'd decided that way back before crossing the Missouri state line so I checked into the new Motel 6 on Connor Street. The room they gave me, 
I could see the whole town spread out all the way to the hills and into the woods. It looked bigger from there. Yet I knew from growing up there were no strangers in that town. A tight-knit community and most are family, one way or another. Nothing had changed. Nothing ever changed. I closed the curtains and went to bed. I woke up with a sudden jolt, my hand grabbing my other arm out of reflex. It felt like someone had stuck me with a hot poker. I squirmed on the bed for quite some time, praying for help that never came. I flicked the bedside lamp on to see what had happened. My stomach dropped, twisted. All I was seeing was skin. Perfectly normal skin, no burns or scratches or bruises. And to make things even stranger, the TV was on, the volume at full blast. I turned it off. I turned the lamp off. And breathed. The room felt strange, sideways, like someone had broken in and couldn't find what they were looking for, leaving everything upturned. But nothing had been upturned. Except for the TV, it was oddly calm. Even the air felt thick and stagnant. I managed to squeeze in a couple hours sleep, somehow. When I woke up, it was the same. Only now, sitting at the foot of the bed, I felt heavier, a little more sick than I was just a few hours before. I got in the shower, made sure the water was steaming hot. Soothing, for maybe 30 seconds. Then the anxiety kicked back in, and I nearly made up my mind to just get in the car and ditch that buggy town and go home where I could shut my windows and know for sure nobody was watching. That's how I felt right then. Like I was being watched. Kind of like a movie. The whole time I was showering, I'd made peace with the fact that some ugly brute with a butcher knife was on the other side of the curtain, licking his lips waiting for me to let my guard down. Yet, no matter how many times I swung open the curtain, ready to strike, there was nothing. Not even a spider. I felt like I was going crazy. I felt like the best medicine for me was to go see some old friends, maybe go and get drunk with them like we did in junior year, and get this day over with. The funeral was nice and pleasant, not too overdone. A lot of people showed up. I knew some of the faces from growing up. Afterward, as we shuffled out into the cold rain, I found Chris. We nodded at each other and talked, catching up. He said the rest of the guys had left a little early and went to Nate's place to get the grill set up and the bonfire going. I told him I'd follow him there. Then, oh shit, I must have left my wallet. I need to run back to my hotel and get it. I was lying right then, that uneasy feeling still bubbling up in my stomach. I needed some fresh air, drove all over town, seeing my parents' house, my old school, and where the old fire station used to be, and where the new one is now. It was all so sad and tired looking, and me driving was just another way to avoid the inevitable. Somewhere on 5th Street, I let out a deep sigh and swung around back towards the direction of Nate's place. The land was as beautiful as it was in high school. Now, Nate owned it, a graduation gift from his uncle. Eight acres of grass and cows and a whole bunch of trees surrounding it, giving off a vibe like a fortress. Sure enough, all the guys were there. I'd be lying if I said I didn't have a good time. The steak was good and the beer flowed like we were 17. I loosened up pretty quick. Each one of us had a story about Cleo, and that night was spent telling them around the bonfire. When Chris was done with his, the fire now died down to just a couple of hot coals, he said he had something for us and went over to his truck. He came back with a big plastic tub and told us what was in there. It was everything Cleo had owned. Cleo's mom, Chris said, had brought it over the day after he had died. She said that she couldn't bear to look at it, that it was best just to let his friends have it. That made his death real to all of us. We were silent for a few moments. Then Chris spoke up, and we all agreed that Cleo's mom was right. Each of us picked through the box and found a couple things we really wanted. I took an alarm clock and this really cool weather radio. What was left were just a few small things we felt weird about taking. How about we just toss it, Chris suggested, his eyes on what was left of the bonfire. So we did, and watched it melt. I was sobering up by then. We all were. We said our goodbyes and went off. I got back to my room a little after two in the morning, threw my things down, and fell asleep. 
Beep. Beep, beep. Beep. Beep, beep. I snapped away, heaving, my heart racing, my arm burning once again. That clock. I knew there weren't any batteries in that damn thing. I checked. But there it was, going like crazy. I slapped it a few times before ear-piercing static nearly sent me into cardiac arrest. The weather radio had now turned itself on, and the volume was getting louder, ignoring my finger slamming down on the off button. All of a sudden, it went silent. Maybe to let the clock have a turn at screaming. Slowly, however, the volume rose and the static intensified. I dug my finger into the off button, and this time it listened. But not for long. The TV popped on. Once more, there was static, and strangely, it sounded the same as the weather radio. Only this time, there was a light hum underneath it, pulsating until I could hear it over the static. It was a voice, and it was talking, begging me to set it free. Then, I heard something I'll never forget. Cleo, the voice said over and over and over and over. It was Cleo. He wanted to be set free. I can't put into words the fear that was going through me. This wasn't Cleo. I remembered my grandma telling me and my sister about demons lying to you to get what they want. Once they know who you are, they play any kind of motion to win. I got up and ripped the TV cord out of the plug, gathered the radio and clock, and went into the bathroom. I filled the tub halfway. Then I threw them in. As they sank to the bottom of the tub, I could hear static. I could hear static drowning, angry, popping and sparking until it died. I grabbed my belongings and checked out and drove back home in the dark through a nasty snowstorm. It was worth it. As soon as I left Missouri, the weight on my shoulders lifted and I forgot about the past two days. It was only after months of blankness that the events flooded back into my mind. I came to conclusion that ghosts and demons or whatever evil is will always be lurking in the shadows, will always be waiting for a soul to be afraid. I made a deal with myself to never mess with that side of the world. It will always lead to hell and suffering. I try to do good now. I go to church just about every week. I need something to protect me. Maybe there's a heaven or maybe it's all in my head but I would like to be prepared for whatever happens. Thank you for allowing me to share my story. I hope my experience gives comfort to those who encounter the paranormal worse than me, because anyone can survive evil if their heart is in the right place. Sincerely, Martin. My One Creepy Story Hi, Steve. I've been enjoying your National Park Mysteries for a few months now. I began listening to you and found out you were from East Tennessee. I was born and raised in Knoxville, so I felt a connection with you because of that. You're a great storyteller, like many people from our neck of the woods. I decided to share an experience of my own. This is completely truthful. It happened in the late 80s, early 90s. My husband, my son, and I were at my parents' home where I grew up. It was Halloween night, and we'd made a little fire in the front yard and were roasting hot dogs and making s'mores. My son had gotten himself in a bit of trouble, and I sent him to the bedroom for a time out. I'd escorted him there and returned to the fire. A short time later, my husband had rejoined me by the fire, and I was toasting a marshmallow. He asked me where our son was going, and I said, he's not going anywhere. He was causing trouble, and I made him sit on the bed until I tell him he can come back out. My husband says to me that he saw our son come out of the house, walk down the concrete pathway, and start down the street. Well, that made me angry, and I handed my husband my stick with a toasted marshmallow still on the end and told him I'd be right back. I looked around and saw nobody outside, so I went in the house. I walked to the bedroom door, opened it, and there my son was still sitting on the bed. He was exactly where I'd left him. Now I was confused. I went back outside and told my husband that our son was still sitting on the bed where I'd left him. My husband continued to insist that he saw him come out of the front door and head down the street. There was a couple living just a short distance from my parents' house that we were good friends with, and my husband thought our son was going to their house. My husband had been at their house earlier that evening. 
I took him inside Mom and Dad's house and showed him that our son was in the bedroom so he could see for himself. After which, we were both perplexed. I asked him repeatedly if he was playing a joke on me for Halloween, and he said no. To this day, we still don't know what actually happened that night. I know that it really frightened me. I know that if my husband had been messing with me, he would have owned up to it at some point. But he never has. I mean, why would anybody prank somebody successfully and not let that somebody know they'd been had? What would be the fun in that? But, like I said, I know my husband, and he would have let me in on the prank that night if it had actually been a prank. Well, that's my one creepy story. Thanks for letting me share it with you. Signed, Karen B. A Ghost Story My friend Boris and his wife and I went over to some brother's farm. The farm had been in their family for a long time, since pioneering days. Their grandpa and grandma died back in the 60s, and the house had been empty since. The brothers had been fighting a lot, and their mom and dad sent them over to live in grandpa's old farmhouse because the fighting was driving them crazy. The brothers invited us over to hang out. I was sitting on the couch with Ryan, and I started smelling this sickly sweet flowers or perfume smell. It kept getting stronger until it was very unpleasant, and there was a cold, sad feeling that came into the room. I said, what is that strong perfume smell? And the oldest brother, Roy, angrily said, it's Ryan's cologne. It stinks like hell. Ryan immediately shouted back, you know it's not me. It's the ghost. Roy shouted back at him to STFU. You want people to think we're crazy? Then I was overcome by this intense sadness until tears started coming out of my eyes. This ghost, or whatever it was, did not like me and wanted me out. I got up and ran out of the house and down the driveway to Boris's car. The feeling left me as soon as I got out of the house and was completely gone by the time they come out to check on me. I told them that the house was haunted by a malevolent spirit and that I would not go back in. The brothers left also. This happened back in the 1970s. Signed, R.H. The Flannel Man In December 2001, I traveled by car with my ex-brother-in-law to a little town called Weaverville in Redding, California, not far from Mount Shasta. We were heading to his grandparents' house for Christmas, something my ex-wife's family did every year. We were newly wedded and just had our first child. This trip will be the first time meeting her father's side of the family. My ex-wife and daughter had traveled by train ahead of us because I had to work. I got along well with her brother, so the road trip had been awesome. Now, on the last stretch of this road trip, we were on a very long and desolate pass, absolute middle of nowhere. Nothing but trees and snow. It was about 10 o'clock at night. The moon was shining, and visibility was about 30 yards into the forest. I was just speechless at the density and vastness of that forest. It felt so full, and yet so empty at the same time. I remember thinking to myself, how could anything survive in that dark snow? When all of a sudden, my brother-in-law said aloud, What the hell? Is that a person? I looked up the road, and sure enough, there was a man walking hard, almost stomping on the side of the pass, standing at least seven foot tall. He was wearing a red and black checkered flannel with blue jeans. I vaguely remember him wearing a duck hunting hat. I could tell he was holding on to something, and it wasn't until we got right up close that we saw that it was a double-edged axe. We slowed down just enough to get a look at his face. I will never forget when he looked at me. His eyes were so sunken in, I could hardly even see them. He had a pale, weathered face and a strong, sharp jaw. Honestly, he looked angry. I mean furious, like he was on his way to kill somebody. I was completely turned around in my seat looking back at him while my brother-in-law stared in his rearview mirror. Just the thought of someone out there in the middle of nowhere was scary, but an angry man holding an axe was absolutely terrifying. We drove away as fast as we could. 
We were breathless. We didn't say a word for a few minutes. Then we both started screaming, what the hell was that? Who was that? Holy shit, he had an axe. We didn't know whether to stop or to keep going. He didn't look like he needed help. He looked evil. Three more hours till we arrived at his grandparents. Mind you, three hours of driving in nothing but forest and snow. I remember just looking into the forest trying to find anything. A cabin, a tent, a campfire, anything. But there was nothing. Nothing but very dark, very cold forest. When we arrived, we were both still shaken up. We tell his grandparents what we just saw and ask him if we did the right thing. Or should we call the authorities and inform them that there's a man with an axe walking the highway and he's liable to freeze to death or kill somebody? His grandfather quickly disregarded our story and said, we're probably just very tired. I distinctly remember him saying, there's no way in hell anyone would be out there. He then asked us if we'd been smoking weed. LOL. We said, no, but that wasn't true. But I've never smoked pot and saw random lumberjacks just appear on the road before. We both know what we saw. We both know it was real. This was not a hallucination. Well, his grandfather called his neighbor, who was volunteer sheriff's deputy, and he called it in. The sheriff's department then dispatched CHP, California Highway Patrol. It was until a few days later that we were told there was no report or evidence of anyone with an axe walking on that highway. When I heard that, I remembered thinking to myself, we saw a ghost. I only posted this story because the other day I was surfing YouTube and I stumbled on the phenomena of the flannel man. My jaw dropped. The hair on my neck stood up and a chill came over my body as I remembered what happened to us. I am grateful for this outlet. I really do appreciate all the stories and theories that are presented on your channel. It feels like I got a little closer to understanding just what happened to us. I will never forget that cold, dark night. Thank you. Signed, C.L. The Translucent Humanoid This is my encounter with a translucent humanoid. Many years ago, when I was living in South Florida, I had a very strange thing happen to me. To start off, the house I was living in was a new structure on drained swampland. It's not like anyone lived there before. Native Americans may have at one time, but the village of Royal Palm Beach had canals built all around it to put the drained water into. This was back in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Our house was a U-shaped CBS block home, hurricane-proof with outer shutters for the windows and glass sliding doors on the back of the house. We also had a thick metal door going into the garage, just in case the roll-down garage doors were blown out during a storm. I lived there with my husband, three daughters, and one son. I was the only one involved in this encounter. Always worked an automotive job at a dealership, worked several different positions in the office and service department. My husband had his own German car repair shop. He was an automotive technician. One day I woke up and noticed I had a lump starting to grow on the right side of my forehead. I would not noticed it before. I was a little concerned, so I made an appointment with my regular doctor in the town next to ours. I was somewhere in my 40s and never had anything like this happen before. My husband also said he thought it was a good idea to see the doctor. I went to my doctor's appointment and waited in the front waiting room, wondering what was going to happen. I've always tried to avoid the doctor's office. I hated going, and this was no different from the other times in my life. Was he going to have to cut into it and take a biopsy? Was I going to have to look like Frankenstein and have big old stitches blaring out at everyone when I was working? Was it cancer? The big C word? By the time I got to see the doctor, I'd worked myself up into a frenzy. My doctor was like, well, calm down and let me take a look. He punched around on it and came to the conclusion that it's probably nothing to be concerned about. Wow, I'm concerned, and I don't think it's going away anytime soon. He said, eh, if it starts to get any bigger, come back. He'd do a biopsy on it, find out what it was and how to treat it. I just wanted this thing off my head. 
All I could see was my uncle, by marriage, that had a large gorter growing off the back of his skull. It was horrifying for a small child at the time to see, and I could not forget it. But let me just say that my uncle was a very sweet man. I was not very happy that the doctor didn't see the urgency in taking some kind of action to get rid of this lump off my head. Well, it was several weeks later, and I thought this thing was growing. Before I got around to calling the doctor for a second visit, I had the strangest thing happen to me. It's very unbelievable, and I would not believe it if I had not experienced this for myself. I was alone at home, standing in my kitchen at the back of the house. I was just leaning on the counter of the bar next to the sliding glass window that opened out to the screened-in back porch. The whole backyard was surrounded by a wooden privacy fence. Our back porch ran the whole length of the back of the house. I had star jasmine bushes planted next to the porch and a hedge to shade the porch. I was just standing there, staring at the bushes, thinking how pretty they were. They had white, star-shaped little flowers all over it. It was a beautiful, sunny day outside. The glass sliding door was completely closed. So, here comes the really crazy part. All the encounters I've read about are by people that have been out hiking or camping in the woods. They have mentioned that the figure also made a clicking noise. Some have even been stalked by them in a menacing way. Some people mention the movie Predator. The alien that had a glassy cloaking device is how they described it. Yes, I'd seen the movie, and when I saw my translucent humanoid, that was exactly how it looked. Wavy glass in a human shape. I was just standing there in the kitchen, looking out my back door. Then in a split second, I could not move, and I stood there paralyzed as this creature walked right out of my closed glass door. It walked right through the glass with no problem at all. I'm having an internal meltdown, but can't move a muscle. I'm trying to scream and run. This thing came toward me on the other side of the counter. It raised its left arm and attached itself to the right side of my forehead. All I could hear was a loud suction noise. It was horrifying. I just had to stand there and let this happen. The noise was deafening. It moved its arm away very slowly, sucking and pulling from the right side of my forehead to the left side. Then it released its connection to my head, and when that happened, my knees buckled and I grabbed the counter to keep from falling. I felt like I was going to pass out, but I didn't. I watched this thing keep moving straight through the den, and it walked right through my metal garage door without opening it. Just walked right into the middle and disappeared. I stood there for a few seconds until I could get a grip on what just happened. I ran out the garage door to see where this thing had gone. The garage roll-up door was open, and I ran out into the driveway to see if I could see where it went. I've never seen it again, and my lump is gone on my head. I don't know how this thing knew I had a lump on my head and why it fixed it for me, but I am grateful that it helped me. This just proved to me that locked doors will not keep this creature out of your house. It will and can walk through anything. And also, whoever made the movie Predator has seen one of these creatures and copied it precisely. Makes you wonder. I spent many years searching the internet looking for other people who encountered these beings. And about two years ago, I stumbled onto some stories on YouTube. It made me feel like I wasn't alone. Just to let you know some of my background, I'm not a nut. I've never done drugs. I have a clean background. I was a licensed officer of the law for the state of Texas for over four years until I hurt my back at home and couldn't work at that job anymore. I've taken psychological tests and passed them all. I've taken polygraph tests for on-the-job interviews years ago back in the 80s in Florida and never failed one. I have absolutely no idea what these beings are or where they come from. But believe me, I have seen one. Signed, Pam A. The Echo Phenomenon Hey, Stephen, Bill. I want to start by letting you know how much I appreciate your work. I think focusing on the strange and unusual is important, as the universe is infinite, the unexplained, odd, and surreal shouldn't be as taboo as it is. I feel as though possibilities are endless. 
and we surely can't be alone or unknown to other worlds, beings, or dimensions. My story is pretty fresh in my mind, and I want to get it to you before it becomes a foggy memory. Six days ago, on the early morning of Friday, May 7, 2021, it was just another day. I worked nights as a nurse, and as a single mother, I occasionally had to bring my kids to work with me so I can get them ready and on time to school in the morning. Their father recently moved away from the neighboring town to Madison, where I've always lived. We decided switching the kids' schools this close to the end of the year would do more harm than good, so we decided to drive them to school in the outskirts of suburb town outside the city for the remainder of the year. It's difficult some days, as the round trip takes about an extra hour, but we manage. This morning was different, though. We all woke up groggy and more tired than usual. I nearly called them off school for a mental health day, but decided against it and got us on the road headed for the interstate. It was around 7 a.m. when we were approaching the town of Windsor. There's a cluster of truck stops, so you'd occasionally see hitchhikers walking along the interstate's shoulder. It was nothing abnormal seeing random people walking along the interstate. But that morning, we passed a man walking directly down the middle. I remember everything around me seemed to be in slow motion, like I was able to focus my attention on this man, although we were traveling at about 70 miles an hour on a busy interstate. It's a few minutes after 7 at this point. My 12-year-old daughter asked, Mom, what is he doing out there? She seemed panicked, with good reason. As we passed him, I kept my eye on him in the rearview mirror, and that's when it happened. An 18-wheeler semi hits him at high speed. It almost seemed as though he turned to dust, completely obliterated. I gasped like the air was hit from my chest, but didn't want to startle my three young kids and have them look back. I was almost in a dreamlike trance after that. I was visibly shook. My daughter is very smart, and I had a feeling she understood what I saw, but I didn't want to ask. I dropped my two oldest off at school and headed back on the neighboring highway leading into Madison rather than getting on the interstate again. Traffic was backed up on the highway because it was detoured from this incident. The highway is always clear and quick. That day, it took me an hour to get back to the west side of the city to get my toddler to daycare. I made it home around 9.15. I noticed that my drive back almost seemed cloudy, like I'm not sure how I made it home. I don't remember driving most of that trip. I sat down and immediately called my mom to tell her what happened. She saw the story being posted all over Facebook. She was as shaken as I was that I witnessed such a tragedy, and with the kids in the car as well. I decided to look up the article and see the events surrounding the man's death, who he was, where he was from, and why he was out there. I read that he was local, but not too many other details. One detail stuck out at me. It was the time of the incident. 3.45 a.m. My stomach sank. The hair on my neck stood up. I thought, that's impossible. So I checked the time the article was released. It was posted about 5 a.m., hours before we had even got in the car. I checked other articles, and they read the same. It was a mistake. So I tried to collect myself and focus on my memory. What I saw, maybe there was a chance I saw something else being hit. But my daughter had asked me about the man walking in the middle lane of the interstate. I wasn't imagining it. He was there. I felt as though I was in a slow motion fog. Like that book, Annihilation, when you're in the shimmer and feel foggy. It was a feeling I'd never experienced before and the feeling probably ended when I got home. I told my mom about it, and she immediately said, you experienced an echo, which roughly translates to an almost ripple in time where an extremely traumatic event lingers, like a place with bad juju. You can feel something bad happen there, but you don't know what. I feel as though I'm connected to things most people can't see or feel. I'm still not for certain what I saw, but I know I wasn't imagining it. If anyone else has experienced anything like this echo phenomena, I would love to hear it. I've attached a link to the article. If anyone knows who this man is, I send my deepest sympathy.
What an awful tragedy, and I hope you find peace. I would also like to remain anonymous, and I thank you for giving me an outlet to tell my extraordinary experience. The Speeding Shadow Me and some friends were out driving around and drove back that two-track. We were in a 68 Buick, and the lane was so narrow the small trees and bushes were making a scratching sound on the sides of the car as we drove back there. We got into a clearing back by the barn and parked. It was dark out, and one of the guys in the car said, What was that? in an alarming sounding voice. We said, What did you see? He said he saw a shadow run from behind a tree to another tree. While he was saying that, I saw it dart from behind the tree to some bushes. We all saw something that moved really fast. It was a shadowy figure of a man, but it moved too fast to be a human, like when you fast forward something on a VCR. And it was getting bolder and coming closer every time it sprinted around. We totally freaked. My friend Billy, who was driving, fired up that old Buick and started driving fast and scared and ran over some small trees and bounced off some bigger ones. I yelled at him to slow down or he was going to kill us. He put some pretty big dents in that old car his grandpa gave him. I'll tell you what. Signed, Randall. What was it? Hi, Steve. I came across your channel and have been enjoying your videos. They are strange and leave us with more questions than answers. I would like to share my experience in the hope another First Nation or anyone, really, steps forward and might have an answer as to what I saw that day. The story took place many years ago. I was seven at the time. It's a strong childhood experience that has stayed with me my entire life. I remember it like it was yesterday. I would also like to add that just last year, we found out my dad has Australian Aboriginal heritage. I think this is important to understand why this occurred. Here goes. When I was a child, my father was a police officer, and he was transferred to the country to run their small station. It was a small country town with a nearby place called Wongan Hills in Western Australia. One weekend, my parents decided to take my sister and I on a day trip to look at some caves that had traditional Aboriginal paintings inside and to climb this large hill. The hill was probably only 70 meters or so up the side, and there were no stairs or signs, just dirt, rocks, and grass. So my mom stayed down in the car while my sister and father and I climbed up the side of this hill. Once you read the top of the hill, it plateaus flat for about 50 meters, then drops down the other side. On the other side, it drops down into a gully with a stream at the bottom, then across the river there was another hill that has ledges and caves jutting out the side. Anyway, we reached the top of the hill, and I remember it was really strange. There were all these rock piles everywhere, like something out of the Blair Witch. They had to have been man-made, but there must have been 10 to 20 of them, each about 30 centimeters tall, using rocks about the size of large marbles. It was a little eerie, and I walked closer to my dad. I remember I turned around to look for my sister, but instead of seeing her, I saw what I can only describe as a traditional Aboriginal man in the one-legged stance. He had a long spear in his hand, which he had pointed to the ground like a walking stick. His face was painted. Long hair with something tied around his forehead and a straw or brown material type skirt covering him. His chest was painted in browns, reds, and whites, and he had one leg tucked up, so standing on one leg. It was like a picture out of a history book. I didn't feel afraid, and I said to my dad, Look, Dad, there's a man with a big stick. My father, being protective and a cop, was on high alert, asking, Where? Where did you see him? He couldn't see him, and the man was right there. I said, he is right there, Dad, but he couldn't see him. When I turned back around, the man was gone. How could that be possible? He was right near us. My dad started pacing around, as there was nowhere to hide up there, and I was trying to keep up with him. He walked over to the edge of the other side, and there he was. The aboriginal man, same stance with the same stick, but now he was on the other side of the stream, staring at me from a red ledge jutting out on the other hill. I yelled, There he is there, Dad, and pointed. It would have been literally and logistically impossible for this man I was seeing to have traveled that quickly in a five to ten second time frame. I can't recall what my dad said or did, but I know he still couldn't see him. Either way, 
my dad decided we should leave and bundled us back to the car. We drove to the next stop, the caves, with the traditional paintings inside, but as we drew near, I felt awful dread start to come over me. By the time we got there, I was hysterical. I wouldn't get out of the car, and I refused to go up to the caves. My family were looking at me like, what is wrong with you? But I didn't know myself. My mom had to stay back in the car with me while my sister and dad went. And I remember watching them walk up to the caves and thinking I was never going to see them again. The fear I felt was debilitating. Nothing I know of happened, and to this day they are fine. But I've always been baffled by what did I see? Was it a spirit? A guardian of some type? A warning? An ancestor bound to the land? I don't know. What I do know is that I was very excited for the caves that day, and after I saw that man, something came over me that felt like impending doom. Deep down, I feel he was telling me not to go on sacred land or walk the land where the caves were. What do you think? Thank you for taking the time to read my email. I hope you're safe and having a good day wherever you are. Signed, Leah. Jellyfish Entity Encounter I'm 40 years old, and this occurred in the early to mid-90s. I can get the time down as I was listening to an Art Bell radio show with Father Malachi Martin, the exorcist. So I went to bed, hit sleep on my radio, 59 minutes, and began listening to Art Bell. Like I said, Father Martin was explaining about his exorcism experiences. I remember hitting sleep on the radio again to listen longer. Now, this is important. I was kind of scared, so out loud I say something to the effect of, I would like to see something try to possess me. I fell asleep shortly after. I wake to see this jellyfish entity floating at the end of my bed, off to the left a little. I immediately hide under my covers. I'm not really that terrified at this exact moment, still half asleep. So at virtually the same moment I notice no radio playing, and I can see an orange glow through my sheets in the direction this thing was. Okay, so I didn't want the thing to notice me. Silly, but that's what I remember thinking. At that exact moment, it all hits me. Art Bell, Father Malachi, Exorcist, Demons. What I remember thinking right before falling asleep. The orange glow became slightly brighter. I panicked and bolted for the closed door. I remember using my blanket as a shield trying to block this thing's view of me. Or maybe my view of it. I bolted because of the feeling I got. Utter dread and terror. I didn't want to see this thing. Didn't want it to see me. And I wanted my mom. I opened the door to see my mother taking off her makeup directly across the hallway from me. I jumped over the bed and slumped into the far corner of the room, farthest away from the door. I couldn't talk straight. I told my mother, and she was convinced I was dreaming. I used to have vivid dreams as a child and act some of them out. Not remember anything in the morning, not even the dream, usually. This thing was orange, and the general shape of a jellyfish. Had to have been five to six feet tall. Bulbous head, classic jellyfish shape. But I don't think it was an actual phantom jellyfish. It was electric. Coursing orange electricity ran through the entire thing, giving off light. The electricity had kind of like a pattern to it. It pulsed light and kind of quivered or vibrated. Like it was alive and intelligent. I only glimpsed it for one to two seconds, tops. Now, I basically convinced myself I was dreaming. I know I wasn't dreaming. I would bet the bank on it. Thanks for reading. I've experienced chills several times while writing this. If you ask me, I would say it was replying to my challenge. It seemed to have woke me up. I just would like to know what this thing is and or if anybody else has experienced this entity. Can't find anything anywhere on it. I want to know for sure I wasn't dreaming. Thanks for reading. Signed, Sirach. One Night at a Week-Long Camp I decided that I would tell the story of a night at a campground called Camp McGee. 
Camp McGee is located in Idaho. This took place during the summer of 1984. Every year, the sixth grade class got to go to a school group camping trip. Any sixth graders in the area who paid to go went for a full week. It was definitely the highlight of the year. On the first day of camp, we all got to know those you shared a cabin with. Twelve cabins in total, six girls' cabins and six boys' cabins. The cabins did not have running water, so no bathroom or shower, which to me was just fine. I was 12 years old, and so was everyone else who went. Every evening after mess hall food, we got the chance to go back to our cabins and get into warmer clothes and get ready for the nightly bonfire. The nightly bonfires was where you told stories and sang songs. You make new friends and enjoy the company. On the third night, after mess hall and getting ready for the night, something happened that was absolutely the strangest and unexpected thing ever. About an hour into the bonfire, I had to go to the bathroom. I really didn't want to go alone, so I asked a couple of girls and they said they would go. I ended up with three others who had the same agenda as me. Potty break. As I said, no bathrooms in the cabin, so we had to make our way to one of the outhouses that was closest to the bonfire area. The only light we had was the bonfire, which was getting further away with every step. The next light was a street lamp. Very dim light, though. The street lamp was barely illuminating a sharp corner on the dirt road leading to the camp. I saw the outhouse and was getting anxious because I really had to go. That's when I got grabbed on my right arm, tightly, which stopped me in my tracks. I was getting ready to ask why she did that when all four of us saw it. Walking steadily down the dirt road was a figure, humanoid shape, tall, wide, and very quiet. It was at least nine to nine and a half feet tall. Its shoulders were at least three and a half feet wide. It easily weighed in the realm of 500 or more pounds. As we stood there gripping each other's arms, it turned its head and looked right at us. It stared at us for probably 30 seconds. It never stopped walking. It kept a steady stride and then slowly turned its head back in the direction it was walking. It walked directly under the street lamp. And that's how we were very positive that it was a male. Its hair was so gray that we had a hard time seeing any brown, red, or black hair. He was slightly bent forward, and I mean slightly. He even had a slight limp, as if he was favoring one of his legs or hips. I've been back up there once a while back, but the camp has been closed for years. Just up the road was a forest ranger station, and that has become a historical landmark. I lost touch with the other girls long ago, but I often wonder if they ever told anyone. And before anyone says, why didn't you tell a counselor? We did. None of them could wrap their heads around what we saw, and because of that, none of them believed we were telling the truth. We did dub him Mr. McGee. This experience made this week of camping the best week ever. Thank you, guys. Signed, C. Allen. CDA, Idaho. Poe House Haunting. Hi, Steve. This was from a Facebook post I did because I told the story so many times. I believe the ghostly toucher on the stairs is believed to be Poe's aunt, Virginia. I believe the ghostly toucher on the stairs is believed to be Poe's aunt. Virginia was 10 at the time. She was 13 when they married. There are lots of other paranormal phenomena as well. But the book I was reading mentioned the stairs specifically, and it's not something I knew. My mother originally had a cadre of doctors recommended by my nurse aunt when she was pregnant with me. I kept trying to abort, apparently, probably having second thoughts about another reincarnation, lol. And they gave her some drug which could have been the one that caused cancer, we later found out. Anyway, my mom didn't want that and switched doctors. My dad was into psychology and young Freud, and he helped her with self-hypnosis, and she decided on a natural, drug-free childbirth. She'd always wanted a daughter especially, and that was me. She ended up going to Dr. Dorman, who actually died right before my birthday in 1998. Dr. Dorman worked out of Church Home Hospital, and this is near Westminster Presbyterian Church and Cemetery, where Edgar Allan Poe was buried and is the hospital he died in. Around sixth grade, I was very active and happy in grade school. 
I love my teacher, and she let me do things like form a school newspaper, The Hub, and I did a report paper on Edgar Allan Poe. Now, I've had experiences all my life, and I loved horror. But those days, I was really more about animals. I wanted to be a zoologist and worked in the animal field even a little after getting married in 1992. And I was focused on my report. My brother ended up having the experience, and he couldn't be more unlike me where that's concerned. Not at all a believer of any kind. He was only eight, being two years younger than me, however. My brother, mother, and I went to the Edgar Allan Poe house, my first visit. It's a small house. There's a lot of stories about it. It was shut up and abandoned for many years, and the part of town was not the greatest area. But it was never broken into or vandalized because of various strange activity reported, lights, etc. My mother and I went up the small staircase to the garret room. My brother was behind us some way, probably looking at things. The stuffed raven used to be in that room on the writing desk, and my mother and I exclaimed that, There's a raven up there. The next thing that happened was the sound of my brother falling down the staircase. I laughed and joked that it was because we said there was a raven up there, but I knew that didn't scare my brother. I was just teasing him. We actually had no idea what happened, and my brother went outside and would not come back in. He waited outside the front door. Later, he told us something had touched him on the shoulder, and that caused him to fall because it scared him. Years later, when I was married and reading a book in bed about haunted places in Baltimore, it said the stairway is often a place people report getting touched. I told my ex-husband about the story. I was so surprised. One other strange thing, aside from both of us being born where Poe died, my middle name is Virginia. Poe's wife's name was Virginia. My brother's middle name was, in keeping with the male side of the family's name, Edgar. When my brother was very little, he used to say he was going to marry me. Signed, Ruth. Sleep Paralysis Story Hi, Steve. Love your shows. Keep up the amazing work. Here's my story. Always enjoyed spending the night with my first love and very best friend, Josh, at his mom's house. Although, since I had started staying with him on the weekends back in 1999, I always felt a feeling like I was being watched, ever feeling alone when you're the only one in the house. Back then, his older sister told me about seeing a little ghost girl in the attic and ghost soldiers marching up the driveway. I originally thought she was toying with me to scare me, but as the years have gone on, she still sticks with these stories. It was a somewhat old house, being built in 1943. It had a very creepy vibe about it. Fast forward, it's 2001, and I'm 16 years old. I'd spent the night with my now fiancé. I woke up the next morning to the sounds of everyone in the kitchen talking and eating breakfast. My fiancé was up before me and had joined them. I quickly realized that I couldn't move. No matter how hard I tried, I'm locked in place. I'm starting to panic, heart racing, thoughts running wild. I try to call out to Josh. I try to call out to anybody. I couldn't talk. I couldn't scream. All I could do is look around and think. As I lay there silently screaming and trying to force any kind of movement from any part of my body, I started to think to myself, this is how I die. Fighting these thoughts, I decided I was not going to succumb to whatever force had taken over me. I pushed myself forward with all of my might, and finally, I broke free. Instantly, as I sat up, I saw a dark shadow move away from my body across the wall to my right and slowly fade. I was so freaked out. I joined the others in the kitchen and tried to act normal. I confided in Josh what had happened, but I left out the part about the shadow, and I'm really not sure why. Maybe I didn't want to sound completely crazy. I don't know. On the way home that day, as I was driving down the road, I felt the unmistakable feeling of someone kicking the back of my seat. I look in my mirror, and there's nothing there. I felt this happen several times before I finally reached my house, thankful that the 15-minute road trip was over. Fast forward two weekends. I come in from Josh's after spending the weekend with him. My mom tells me the story of how she and my brother were up late that Saturday night watching a movie. 
She says they were sitting in the dark, and my brother asked her why I didn't want to watch the movie with him. She told him I was staying at Josh's that night and wasn't home. He said he had just seen me walk by in front of the TV. She said to him, that wasn't your sister. She's not here. He totally freaked out by this and goes to check my room and then the rest of the house, only to confirm that I was not home. My mom had seen the dark shadow go by the TV. She didn't say anything to him because she didn't want to scare him. She knew they were the only two people in the house at that time. The story chills me to the core. It only confirms what happened a couple weeks prior to me. I told my mom what happened to me when I awoke that morning a couple weekends ago and about the kicking on the back of my car seat on the way home. She was horrified. She told me that I brought something home. Spirit or a demon, but definitely something. I'm now 36. I still live in the same house. I bought it from my parents and they downsized. Over the years, I never experienced anything else from this shadow entity, apart from thinking I'd see something out of the corner of my eye or being watched or not alone or something to that effect. When I was roughly 25, I battled some serious demons of my own with prescription painkillers and insomnia, among other things. I started to experience what the doctor later described as sleep paralysis. Every single night for a while, and then it slowly dissipated. It was pretty common and almost a part of my nightly routine for about three years, though. Some of the scariest things I've ever seen in my life. There's no fear like waking up in a dark room lit only by moonlight with a feeling of something holding you down. Then the covers slowly rise in front of your face and all you can see is a red-eyed demon with a wide, drooling mouth growling and clawing at your flesh. Thank God those days seem to be over. I can understand the medical definition of sleep paralysis, but until you've been there, I don't think you can really grasp how scary these episodes are. And why is it, when you pray, only then does this evil leave you? Medical or spiritual slash paranormal? It's hugely debated online, as I've researched it over the years. I really don't recall one person that has ever experienced it believing the medical definition, though. Either way, I know that first experience was paranormal in nature because I'm not the only one who saw it. My mom still gives me hell for bringing that thing home. To conclude my story, Josh and I dated for five years before we decided to break up. For 20 years, he was my very, very best friend. He was like home my comfort zone, and we never stopped loving each other. It was beautiful. We both went on to marry, me twice to his once. He always said he didn't want kids. I tried and tried to talk him into it, telling him that he needed someone to carry on his name and he was the last male in his family. One day, he calls me and he's changed his mind. His wife is pregnant. I was overjoyed at the thought of a little Josh running around. He called me that day in April 2018 to tell me about the arrival of his baby boy, Jax. It was a quick conversation. Had I known it would be our last, I would have kept him on the phone much, much longer. Josh passed away October 2018, leaving behind his wife, new baby, and many, many more that loved him. He was 34 years old, a Marine vet that proudly served his country. He didn't use drugs, and although he drank heavily in prior years, he had quit that with becoming a family man. He was a vibrant, healthy 34-year-old male with no history of blood pressure or anything like that. He went to the hospital with a severe headache on Tuesday and was pronounced dead by Sunday with a stroke. This has devastated me. I cannot wrap my head around it. Although I could have left out that part and made my story shorter, I wanted to continue our 20-year chapter to be nostalgic. And also to ask you or any listeners of your channel what they make of this very sudden and unexpected passing. It just doesn't feel right to me. How does a healthy human just die? Of a stroke, no less. Anyway, guys, thanks for listening to my story and my continued rambles of my good old days with my best friend. Love you guys. Signed, Melissa. Werewolf Entity Dream So love the stories and videos. Take them all with a grain of salt because the vast majority of people are liars in one way or another inherently but also know from personal experience that things like the stories in your videos, these types of things do happen alarmingly, often rarely leaving behind even the slightest concrete evidence. So I do believe that all the things could have happened to these individuals, but remain constantly skeptical about everyone's stories. But who knows? 
Maybe the only way we could even hope to possibly solve some of the missing 411 cases and causes is by finding out from those lucky individuals who made it. No 411 story, but still got some weird stories. So here's one of the most strange, and for me, the kind of fear that paralyzes you. The kind that leaves one stuttering with no words, and even if you did, you wouldn't even be able to audibly form a full word. So here's my story, and you can believe it or not, but either way, it happened. This occurred around 1994 or 95, and I was around 9 or 10 years old. I live in Tucson, Arizona, and have for most of my life thus far, and live within an eighth of a mile or less from the largest Hohokam Indian burying ground and ceremonial complex where they found at least 400 remains and countless artifacts. And it's currently being developed for houses as I type this. Straight right on top. Oh my God, those poor people. Anyways, this house I lived in as I grew up was very, very haunted. All of our dogs ran away and got hit by cars, and you couldn't drag our dogs to one side of the yard. And when you were anywhere in sight of that side of yard, your back burned from the overwhelming feeling of being intensely watched. When I would have friends over and we would run around and play guns or tag, I would notice that my friends who had no concept or knowledge of the paranormal or the experiences with the paranormal occurring in my house, they would always unconsciously only play on one side of the yard. So I always had scary things happening to me. And, according to my mom and dad, I was even having those type of experiences as a baby. So I was scared of the dark, or should I say the things that come out of the dark. Things that are so dark that even in a pitch black room, the entities are so much darker than that. Things that can touch, hit, scratch, bite, choke, and harm you. They can manipulate your thoughts and dreams. They can reach out and touch you while you're at your most vulnerable. But I digress. Let's just say I had a long, terrifying build-up to this story, which made the encounter with something that much worse for me. So I was sleeping one night, and I had a dream. In my dream, it was daytime, although it was really nighttime. So I see like a camera angle, pointing at this werewolf-looking creature running up my street. So I live in a pretty typical residential neighborhood, where I have people who live around and behind me, where we share the back wall in my backyard with those people who live behind me, if I jumped my back wall, I would be in my neighbor's yard, where if you could tightrope walk, you could walk in between my street and the one behind my house, in between the houses. If you walk this route, you could see all the way down the street. If you look straight ahead, and if you turned your head to the right, you would see all my neighbor's houses eventually coming to my house. And if you turned your head to the left, you would see the houses of the people who live behind me. In my dream, I see this creature that immediately scared me, running on the fence line like a balance beam, and it was coming fast. The way I saw him was like the action shot from a movie chase scene, where it was viewpoint above and to the side, and it was following along with the same angle as continued running. I somehow knew he was coming to my house. As he got to behind my neighbor's house, I saw the two Rottweilers that lived in the yard directly behind my neighbor's house, meaning the next yard he would come to was mine. The people's dogs began very aggressively barking at this thing, and it just glanced over at them and growled and showed his teeth, and they barked even louder and harder trying to get at the entity, but impeded by a small fenced-off area under the porch. As he continued running, he arrived at my house. Just as soon as he reached my house, I saw him jump off the tops of the wall and fences, and as soon as his feet touched the ground in my yard, I immediately saw the viewpoint angle change, and I was now seeing through his eyes. I saw him run up to my back patio glass door, and again, immediately upon reaching his hand out to the handle of the door, I jolted and sat up out of bed. I was drenched with sweat and was already scared from that nightmare when I noticed that I could somewhat faintly but clearly hear the dogs from my dream barking just like they had been in my dream. Right then, I felt the temperature in my room plummet and knew what was about to happen. Within three seconds or so, my bedroom door swung open and this thing walked in. He was so tall that he had to bend over to walk through my door. He was semi-transparent and almost kind of glowed, if you want to call it that. He didn't emanate light, and light from him didn't illuminate anything around him. He just glowed. I would say that he was around eight to nine feet tall, and although this sounds kind of funny now, he looked like Chewbacca from Star Wars, but built like Abraham Lincoln. He had pants on that were too short for his legs, and they appeared to be old and torn. I assure you that my little butt was scared. I might have even peed myself a little. 
I'd just gotten brave enough to sleep without a nightlight, and I'd just started sleeping with my door shut finally, and in the dark, and then this happened. I tried to call for my mom, but I could only stutter, Ma, Ma, Ma. I guess I thought the best option was to pull the covers over my head when the initial paralysis wore off. And as I shook and cried in fear in my makeshift fort, then I remembered my mom always told me that if I was facing something scary, to call on Jesus. At first I could only stutter, J, 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 J. and then I thought it, Jesus, Jesus, I said to myself and in my head at first. Then I said it out loud, and then slowly peeked out of my blanket hut and saw him just grinning terribly at me. I said it again, and he growled at me and showed his teeth, which were very large, and he turned and walked to the door, bent over, and walked out. Now, I've used the name of Jesus on many occasions when faced with any type of night bumpers, and I have to say that there is power in that name, but even more in the claiming of his blood. It matters not whether it's boogeyman, werewolves, ghosts, demons, chupacabras, or those green-toed fungus monsters from the commercials. And well, that's my story. Thanks for listening. Take this however you want to take it, but it happened. Signed, Anonymous. My Daughter's Experience My family and I were camping at the end of June of this year. It was my husband, our daughters, a son-in-law, and one grandchild. Everything was great. We had a spectacular time. About a month later, after the trip, my eldest daughter, who was in a tent by herself, told me about an experience she had while we were in the woods. She told me that she had woken during the night to a snarl-like growl, and what she could only explain as a weight on her chest, and what it felt like something holding her down at the shoulders. When she heard this snarl-slash-growl, she was understandably startled and thought, What the F is that? She couldn't move. She looked around her tent and could tell everything was secure. Then the weight was gone and she bolted upright. She was scared to death. She had to go to the bathroom but wasn't going to leave her tent for any reason until dawn. The next morning she woke up to a horrendous nosebleed, which she never gets. I believe she had a supernatural experience, as I believe that there are beings out in the woods that we can't explain. Thank you, Julie. Werewolf of Wisconsin Hello, I have a real-life story I would like to share. My name is Sean, and I'm a truck driver from Florida. I drive all over the United States and Canada. I started my career in December of 1999. The following year, I found myself driving I-94 from Washington State to New Jersey, running apples and cranberries. I was 22 in 2001, young and full of energy. One late evening, late in the month of September, I wanted to get out of the truck and get a few beers. So I stop in Toma, Wisconsin at the Holiday Inn. Park my truck and check in at the local bar inside. Before I knew it, I was talking and hooked up with a sweet Swedish girl who was an exchange student, smoking hot little blonde. As the night progressed, we left in her car, drove around town to another bar, and stayed there until it closed around 2.30 a.m. or so. We spent the night partying and enjoying each other's company. She looks at me and asks me later, let's go joyriding. I said, okay. Both of us were pretty drunk, I guess. Neither of us should have been driving at all, but we did. We headed south of town and into the pitch black of the countryside as the city's lights one by one disappeared. We made our way to a set of railroad tracks. She stops the car on the tracks. It was a yellow car, if I recall. There was just enough light to see the tree line across the field. We climb out and set on the hood, which coaxed me to join her in a little pleasure. The mood was definitely set between us. Peace and calm was simple during our passion. The only light was the headlights from her car, piercing the blackness of the night. It was easily past 3 a.m. at this point. She is lying on the hood, and my back is turned to my surroundings. Suddenly, we both heard a god-awful cry like a howl from a nightmare. It was louder than any lion and a measure of equal size and piercing the inner core of us both. It literally went through me. It definitely snuck up on us. My blood instantly ran cold. I went stone sober, my heart frozen in pure and utter fright, 
true and pure fear. I could feel whatever it was breath on my neck. I could hear its breath as I froze in my position. She leaned up, very slowly looking over my shoulder, and I could see the reflection in her eyes of the beast. Blood-curdling scream came next as we, both, ran for the doors of her car. I was driving and in full reverse with her beside me on the passenger seat. We raced to an intersection, flipped the car around back to Toma we went, with dirt and gravel flying and the rubber burning. She was begging me not to drop her off at home. She was beyond frightened to death. If our hair would have turned white, it would not have been a shock to me, as I was equally frightened with her over the whole encounter as well. We went back to my truck until daybreak and awoke in each other's arms. I will never forget that night, nor the beast that hunts the countryside. A short term later, I ran across an article called The Beast of Bray Road. Strange stories, legends, folklore of werewolves or dogmen. I can honestly say I will not go into the countryside at night to this day. It scares the hell out of me. There's something out there, and it's no house cat. I only have a fear of God and what I survived with that deadly nightmare. I'm a strong man, God-fearing, growing up in the North Florida woods and swamps, hunting and such. It was no normal animal, but something else. Deep in my heart and soul, I believe we were lucky and survived an attack from a werewolf. I'm not a coward, and I'm not scared to say that the legend is true. Watch your back in the North Woods. Don't ever trust the dark around you. P.S. It's all fun and games until it happens to you. I don't laugh at people's stories now because this was mine. My heart goes out to the missing and the disappeared ones and their families. You're not alone. Signed, Sean. Stick Being Encounter My experience with a stick being wasn't unpleasant because it was so mischievous and made me smile. This was 30 years ago, and I collected bare winter branches from the floor of the woods to display in a white china vase in my home. After a few days, I started to find things disappearing, and a little time later, finding the missing object in a ridiculously visible place. Example, losing my watch from beside my kitchen sink, then finding it balanced on the rim of the bath a floor above me, and after I'd had a bath, when there was no sign of my watch there. Another time, I saw peripherally a small black knobby stick man about 18 inches high and twig limbs about as thick as your little finger, an oval smooth face, sparkling eyes, thin-lipped, big grin, and really funny nub-like hair and fronty bits too, and a darkish charcoal color peeping at me from various places, and I would hear a rather delightful tinkly laugh, and I knew it meant me no harm and was having fun with me, so I began chatting with him knew he was male somehow, as if he were just a pal or friend visiting me and leaving out nuts and honey in a tiny pot and bits of fruit at night, and it was always gone in the morning, even the tiny pot. I knew, after a time, that he wasn't there by chance, so I thought back to see when he might have arrived. It didn't take long to realize it was the sticks I'd taken. He'd come with them. So I took them from the vase and announced I was sorry I'd taken the twigs without permission and was taking them back where I'd found them but that I'd enjoyed his company and pleased he'd liked my food gifts, and he was welcome to return any time. I returned the sticks and twigs and said sorry for just taking them, and left, but learned a valuable lesson, never to take things from nature, but always ask permission first. It's so important, because nature spirits can cause you misfortune, even illness, if you disrespect them. I always ask, even when berry picking, and if I feel a negative atmosphere, I go somewhere else. I used to call my visitor Twig Man, and yes, he occasionally returned, and I gave him food gifts, and sometimes he left me seeds, which I planted. This is true, and it never struck me as being odd or thinking I was delusional. I'm very stoic and level-headed, but I'm not blinkered. Please respect nature, and it will respect you, and often give you things money can't buy. Good things for your well-being. Thanks. Signed, Anonymous. Shadow Entity Encounter This happened to me in 2016. I moved from New Mexico to Washington State. Well, I used to go walking with family members every morning after taking our children to school near Battleground, Washington, in Battleground Lake State Park. On this particular day, she had errands to run, so I found myself going alone. I parked my car, get out, stretch, get ready for my three-mile daily walk, 
So I started off walking, got about five minutes into the park, and everything fell quite eerily quiet at that moment, and nothing looked familiar. I got this weird feeling I was no longer alone, and I could feel someone or something watching me as I panicked and started walking faster. I could hear twigs breaking around me in every direction. So I started walking even faster. Suddenly, I was in a full-on running sprint. I broke from the tree line and ended up really far from my car, like 15 minutes away, when I know I had barely walked a few minutes. I could still hear hurried footsteps behind me, though, and all of a sudden I felt hands behind my back, and I was shoved so hard to the ground. Whatever had done it, done it with such hatred and anger, that when I fell, I actually heard my bones break underneath me. I'd shattered my elbow and broke my wrist, and that's not even the worst part. It had done it in front of an oncoming vehicle. Well, thank God the person driving had seen me before I was pushed in front of his car, but he did say he saw what looked like a humanoid, shadowy figure literally push me in front of his car. The damn thing literally tried to kill me. And I tell you one, I never went for a walk in those woods again. Signed, Anonymous. The Ghosts in the Barn When I was a kid in Ohio, my friends had a building behind their house. The big part of the building was locked up, and the one end they used as a garage. I was snooping around and found a secret passage into the other side of the building that was locked up. The garage had a second floor, and I went up there, and the sun was shining just right, so it was coming through a hole in the wall. I went over, pushed on it, and it moved. I pushed harder, and it slid to the right, and there was an opening. I looked in, and it was the huge other side of the building, full of all kinds of stuff. There was a ladder that you had to go down from the second story to the ground level. I climbed down the ladder and was looking around. It was like King Tut's treasure room to a little kid, an old Victrola and stacks of 78 RPM records, stacks of old tin-type photos. I thought they were gold, so I started shoving them in my jean jacket pockets. Just then, I heard a crash, and things started flying through the air. Then a big crowbar flew past my head, and I hauled ass up that big ladder and into the second story over the garage and down the stairs and ran all the way home. I still have those ten types. Those ghosts were pissed that I was messing with their stuff. Signed, Anonymous. My Weird Experience Hello. I was ten years old in 1989. I grew up in southeast Los Angeles. I lived next to my elementary school and would spend a lot of time there playing basketball and other games with my friends. My encounter happened in the summer of 1989. It was mid-afternoon, around 1 or 2 p.m. I was walking home from the school after playing basketball. I was alone. After exiting the school gate, I walked down the alley and entered the driveway that led to my backyard. My backyard was not gated in, so anyone could walk through the alley behind my yard and out to the main street. I remember it being very hot. So hot, most kids gave up on playing and went home. I did the same. As I made my way down the driveway and onto the grass in my backyard, I was no longer dribbling the basketball, just tossing it up and catching it. We had a half-dead plum tree in my backyard, and as soon as I was lined up with it, I noticed something simply appear. It materialized out of thin air and almost seemed like it was dropped there. What I saw as a ten-year-old boy was a man-like being in a skin-tight body-covering suit. The suit was dark, and I don't remember a face, although I do remember it asking, What are you? Needless to say, I was stunned. I did not answer. Just as fast as it or he materialized, it seemed to vanish. I remember standing there in my backyard shocked, asking myself, Did that just happen? I remember walking past my dad in the garage and walking straight into my room with my basketball still in hand. I normally always left it outside. I remember being in my room thinking, Should I tell Mom? No, she wouldn't believe me. Who would? I was perplexed. So I've told one person this story. That's it. 2009, I worked a graveyard for a production company and would listen to Coast to Coast AM. They would have miscellaneous nights where people could call in and tell their spooky stories. Well... In 2009, someone called Coast to Coast and basically told the same story I'm telling you. I sat there and listened to the man tell his story, 
and it took me back to my backyard in 1989 when that strange being asked me, What are you? I wasn't scared, just in utter shock. And I just knew nobody would believe me, because I never told anyone. It was a relief to hear someone else relay that same experience years later. I often wonder how many people have been asked, What are you? by this being. Love your channel. Take care. Signed, J-Mo. Well, there you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this marathon. Take care of yourselves and each other. I'll see you a little farther on down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time.